All right. Hi, welcome. Um, this is going to be a long one today because this is actually going to be lectures 12 and 13 all in one video. So this actually should say personality disorders one and two because it's two lectures about personality disorders. Okay. So in these two lectures, I'm going to cover the definition of personality disorders and the definition of personality. I'm going to go into the symptom criteria for each disorder and um, show you the results of a class survey activity that we did in the last class. The new content for today and um, Tuesday, so the two lectures, will be an exploration of the cluster B personality disorders according to the splitting theory that, divide, that says that personality disorders are more similar to other personality disorders in their cluster than they are to each other. Um, and then I will briefly review the attachment and schema theory of personality disorders, which is a lumping theory that says that personality disorders are more similar to each other than they are to symptom disorders. There are gonna be two guest conversations with this lecture, but um, neither of them is edited yet. So they're not gonna be in the video for this lecture. They'll be posted alongside the lecture videos, um, hopefully by Monday at the latest, but ideally Sunday, I'm working on it. Okay. So we're gonna start out with what is a personality disorder. And those of you who were in class last Thursday, um, you can skip this section if you want, or just go back and review it later. Um, but this will be new information if you didn't come to class on Thursday. So a personality disorder is basically a person, someone with personality traits that are seen as non-normative and or seen as negative and bad in their cultural context. The technical definition of a personality disorder is a pattern of inner experience and behavior that deviates from expectations of an individual's culture. Pattern of inner experience and behavior is just another way of saying personality. So personality disorders generally begin in childhood or adolescence, but they can't be diagnosed until adulthood. And that's because personality traits aren't stable until someone has reached at least young adulthood. The important thing to think about with personality disorders, just like every disorder that we've talked about, but more so with personality disorders is that they are dimensional and everyone has some of these symptoms or traits. Everyone is on the spectrum of all 10 personality disorders to some degree or another. So one feature of personality disorders that is supposed to set them apart from um, other disorders, which are known as symptom disorders when they're being compared to personality disorders, is the egosyntonic nature of personality disorder symptoms. So egosyntonic basically just means consistent with a person's identity or self-image. Um, in this case, consistent with their personality. And it's true that um, people with personality disorders often don't feel particularly impaired by their personality disorder symptoms because they don't see them as symptoms, they just kind of see them as who they are. Um, and when people with personality disorders seek treatment, it's often for a comorbid condition and not for the personality disorder itself, although we will talk about exceptions to that. However, just like, again, everything, um, egosynthesis exists on a spectrum. And in this case, we can put um, the disorders that we've already talked about along this spectrum. Of course, it's gonna be different for everyone. And there are some people for whom symptoms of the, their disorder are highly egosyntonic, even though that's not the norm for that disorder. So an example of a, um, a disorder that's low in egosyntonicity on average is specific phobia. People with specific phobias have lots of opportunities to observe big differences in their behavior and inner experiences when they're going about their normal life versus when they're confronted with their phobic object or situation. Because by definition, um, specific phobias are circumscribed, which means that they um, focus only on a certain narrow context and don't affect the rest of a person's life very much. They tend to be really egodystonic. A person can see a clear distinction between their normal behavior and their behavior when they're having symptoms. Social anxiety disorder may be a little bit closer to the egosyntonic end of the spectrum than specific phobia because social anxiety is closer to a, a personality trait. It tends to start in um, adolescence, but usually there are childhood precursors like shyness or even specific or selective mutism. So social anxiety, the tendency to feel anxious in social situations is more like a personality trait, but social anxiety disorder is still a departure from normal functioning. And it's a departure from that individual's normal functioning because they can observe differences in how they act and feel around people that they know really well versus how they act and feel around strangers. So even though it's more pervasive in, in a person's life, it's still egodystonic because people can still see a difference between their normal self and their anxious self. Depression and generalized anxiety disorders start to be closer to the egosyntonic end because both have a longer symptom duration. 
and both affect um, mood and cognition across contexts and in many different domains. Um, people with major depressive disorder experience low self-esteem and having this disorder changes the way that they view themselves. People with generalized anxiety disorder tend to be high in trait level neuroticism. So even, when, even before they were fully symptomatic with GAD, they tended to be people who were prone to anxiety, prone to worry, prone to fear. Um, still though, these are episodic disorders, so they tend to wax and wane. Um, or in the case of major depressive disorder, some, in like half of cases, a person will have one episode and never have another episode. So in that regard, they are egodystonic because a person with the disorder can look back on how they were before or how they were when they were less symptomatic and contrast that with how they feel and act while they had symptoms. Getting closer to the egocentric end of the spectrum would be something like persistent depressive disorder, which is a chronic mild form of depression that lasts um, two years or longer. So one of the criteria for a personality disorder is that it's pervasive, but persistent depressive disorder is a fairly pervasive form of depression that again, can make it difficult for a person to distinguish their behavior and feelings with symptoms from their behavior and feelings without symptoms. But according to this um, breakdown, personality disorders are still the most egocentric because they are very pervasive, they're very long lasting, they influence everything about how a person sees themselves in the world. So the behaviors that are outgrowths of the way that someone sees themselves in the world um, that hasn't changed since adolescence and that they identify as part of their personality feels egocentric to most people with personality disorders. Okay, so to contrast personality disorders and symptom disorders, and this is kind of a takeaway from the last couple of slides. And again, symptom disorders are all the other disorders that we've talked about so far. Personality disorders are the 10 disorders that we're going to talk about in this lecture. So by definition, personality disorders are supposed to start early in life. They're trait-like, early emerging and pervasive. So again, they start early in life and they influence behavior in a range of contexts. They're not context dependent. They're stable. So people with personality disorders have these traits early on and they keep having them until they're older and throughout their lives. They don't tend to get worse or wax and wane like symptom disorders. Uh, personality disorders are thought to be egocentric, um, although I, again, this is not like a clear black and white distinction and personality disorders are more or less egocentric for different individuals. And then lastly, um, personality disorders involve chronically impaired interpersonal functioning. So to contrast this with symptom disorders, well, symptom disorders do often start early in life. So anxiety um, typically has an onset in childhood. A majority of anxious adults were anxious kids. Um, a disorder like schizophrenia, even though psychosis doesn't have childhood onset, prodromal schizophrenia can begin in adolescence. And even before the first prodromal symptoms emerge, there's evidence that kids who will go on to develop schizophrenia have differences in cognitive development that they're essentially born with. So while symptom disorders don't have to start early in life, they often do. Personality disorders are trait-like based on differences in personality. Well, neuroticism is a personality trait that's a risk factor for most personality disorders as well as most um, symptom disorders. Other um, trait-like and early emerging features of symptom disorders are, like I said, the schizophrenia prodrome or hypomanic temperament, which is a personality type that people who are predisposed to bipolar disorder have. Symptom disorders differ from personality disorders in that while they can be stable, and they often are, they also often have a waxing and waning course. So like um, generalized anxiety disorder, people tend to have exacerbations when they're under stress. And then at other times in their life, their symptoms are more minimal, even though they might still be there. So that's a waxing and waning course. Symptom disorders can also have a progressive course. So severe mental illness like bipolar disorder and schizophrenia, the longer it goes untreated, the worse the symptoms tend to become. That's not true of personality disorders either. So personality disorders, unlike symptom disorders, don't wax and wane, and they don't get worse over time. Symptom disorders, like we said, or like I just said, can be um, egocentric or egodystonic, but I would argue so can personality disorders sometimes. So I don't think that's a huge difference. To me, the biggest difference is that interpersonal functioning impairment is core to personality disorders, and it really is distinct from symptom disorders. Interpersonal impairment is not a diagnostic criteria for any symptom disorder. 
um, although it can be present because of the symptoms. That being said, when it's present because of the symptoms, that implies that when the symptoms aren't there, the impairment isn't there. Whereas for personality disorders, interpersonal relationships are impaired all the time. Also, the impairment of interpersonal functioning is pervasive across different relationship types, whereas in symptom disorders, if there is any level of interpersonal impairment, like for example, in social anxiety disorder, it's not pervasive. It applies only to strangers or unfamiliar people and not to the patients, friends, and family, for example. Um, an example of how interpersonal functioning might be impaired specifically when symptoms are present is the stress generation hypothesis of major depressive disorder. Um, this theory is that when people are currently depressed, they engage in patterns of thinking and behavior that can lead to more stress in their lives, including interpersonal stress. There's not a lot of evidence that people with depression are like this when they're not symptomatic. It seems to be really specific to having the symptoms of depression. On the other hand, people with personality disorders, their interpersonal functioning is just impaired across the board. So their behavior tends to alienate or upset the other people in their lives. And they also often have a hard time relating to the people in their lives. They might get frustrated that other people don't live up to their expectations or that other people's behavior violates their strongly held beliefs. Um, when people with personality disorders seek treatment, it's often because their loved ones or their family members are upset and distressed by their symptoms, more so than the patient with the personality disorder themselves. So personality disorders start early in life and they involve pervasive patterns of behavior. They do tend to be stable over time, but the main difference from symptom disorders is impaired interpersonal functioning. It's important to remember, as we talk about these disorders, that people with personality disorders aren't bad people. They don't have bad or damaged personalities. What they have is maladaptive and interfering patterns of thought and behavior um, and emotion, which is exactly the same as every disorder that we've talked about. So in the anxiety disorders lecture, I focused a lot on how people's interpretation of the world and their place in it can influence avoidant behavior and anxious feelings. That process is also happening in personality disorders. The difference is that they're more stable and pervasive and they involve more interpersonal impairment. Okay, so what is personality? Personality is defined as a characteristic set of behaviors, cognitions, and emotions that an individual feels most of the time in most situations. Basically, it's how a person tends to respond to events that happen to them and how they tend to interact with other people. Psychologists have pretty much agreed that there are five broad personality characteristics that encompass pretty much every um, interpersonal personality description. So any way that you could describe someone, it will fall under one of these five big umbrellas. The first is openness. So whether someone is rigid on the one hand and closed-minded versus curious, thoughtful, interested in playing with ideas, interested in having new experiences on the other end. Um, someone who's conscientious is efficient and organized. They are hardworking. They always fulfill their responsibilities. Whereas, and they're, um, they're clean and tidy. Whereas someone on the other end of conscientiousness might be messy, they might be careless, they might be disorganized, they might um, be irresponsible. People who are extroverted are outgoing, they have a lot of energy, they like um, being leaders in groups. People who are introverted prefer being alone, they tend to um, be shy or reserved in interpersonal activities, and they would say that they find a lot of interpersonal engagement kind of draining and tiring. People who are high in agreeableness are friendly and easy to get along with. They also tend to have a lot of empathy, sympathy, and kindness, so pro-social behaviors. People who are low on agreeableness tend to be hard to get along with. They might be described as um, difficult, challenging, or they might just come across as emotionally unengaged, detached, not that interested in other people. Neuroticism is the one that we've talked about a lot already in this class because it's a factor in the majority of psychopathology, especially anxiety and depression. But people who are high on neuroticism tend to feel a lot of negative emotion. Either they feel negative emotion in more contexts in response to more environments, or they feel it more intensely when they do feel it or both. People who are low on neuroticism tend to be st pretty stable, easygoing, um, fairly confident and not prone to anxiety and depression. So like I said, neuroticism is a feature of all psychopathology, especially anxiety and depression. But another difference between personality and symptom disorders is that all five personality traits are implicated in different ways in personality disorders. 
And going back to that, that's simply not true about anxiety or depression. So someone can be depressed and agreeable. They can be depressed and extroverted. They can be depressed and conscientious. They can be depressed and closed-minded. Someone can be anxious and open to new experiences, but the anxiety impairs their actual ability to have new experiences. It doesn't mean that it changes their personality. Personality disorders are defined by typically abnormally high or abnormally low levels of each of these traits. So that's another difference to think about. So there is a bit of a debate in the field of, of social and personality psychology about how stable personality really is. So if you remember the definition I gave earlier is that personality refers to a pretty stable tendency to respond the same way to situations over time. But personality isn't 100% stable across contexts. So within an individual, there can be variability about how they feel and behave depending on the context. So someone might be relatively more extroverted, meaning like energetic, excited, having lots of um, positive emotions, wanting to be a leader, wanting to be the center of attention. Someone can be a lot like that with their family and friends who they're close to, but they might be more on the reserved, introverted end of the spectrum when they're with their work colleagues. And in extreme cases, there are environments that could elicit highly introverted, highly neurotic, highly disagreeable, highly conscientious behavior in almost anyone. So for example, um, people who are in prison and trying to get out on good behavior, that environment would make everyone act more conscientious more agreeable, but it, there's question as to whether it actually changes how people feel. We do know that there are changes in personality over time. So one, one way that personality changes is called maturation, which is um, within an individual, changes in the mean level of personality traits over time. And maturation tends to look the same for everyone. So basically everyone tends to get more conscientious and more agreeable with age. There's some evidence too that people might get less open to new experiences with age. These changes are, um, they're intra-individual changes, which means that they're a change in an individual's mean level of a personality trait, but there tends to be inter-individual stability, which means that if someone was really high in conscientiousness compared to their peers when they were 16, they would stay high in conscientiousness compared to their peers as they and their peers age, even though all of them are getting more conscientious with age. Another way that personality can change over time is um, cohort effects. So there are generational changes in what can be seen as like the average personality. And that has to do with the influence of the environment on personality. So different environments reward different personality traits. And people are capable to some extent of changing their personalities or playing up certain traits that are beneficial. So broad environmental factors that influence a whole generation can also change average level personality. Okay, so now we are going to um, get into personality psychopathology. So personality disorders are broken down into three clusters of um, different but similar personality traits and disorders. So cluster A is known as the odd or unusual personality cluster. Cluster B is the dramatic erratic cluster. And cluster C is the anxious avoiding cluster. And one approach to understanding personality disorders is what's known as the splitting approach. And this is the theory that each personality disorder is more similar to the other personality disorders within its cluster and also to other symptom disorders that are similar to those personality disorders than personality disorders are to personality disorders in other clusters. So according to this way of understanding personality disorders, you can think of cluster A personality disorders as being on the psychotic spectrum. And we talked about this a little bit in the psychosis lecture and we'll review it again today. Um, you can think of cluster C personality disorders as being on the anxiety spectrum, and we'll go over that later in this lecture. And then lastly, um, cluster B personality disorders, they are more similar to each other than they are to other personality disorders according to this model, but there's no group of symptom disorders that really matches this cluster of personality disorders. But according to the splitting approach, what ties all the cluster B personality disorders together and makes them similar is that they all involve deficits in emotion regulation. And that's gonna be the focus of the next part of this lecture. The lumping approach to studying personality disorders suggests that all personality disorders are more similar to other personality disorders than they are to symptom disorders because personality disorders involve disordered attachment. And that will be um, covered at the end of this lecture. So I guess technically lecture 13. Okay, 
So the next um, series of slides are going to describe the DSM diagnostic criteria of each personality disorder. Um, I don't usually do this, but it with personality disorders, these are basically just descriptions of a type of person. And it's often the best way to kind of understand what these personality disorders look like. Another good way of understanding is to try to find examples or prototypes of people who have these personality traits, um, which is the activity that we're gonna be doing in the next class. Okay, so on the 10 slides that describe personality disorders, there's going to be just an overall description here in this blue box. And this description is the basic personality, but what's being described here isn't necessarily disordered. Someone can be like this and not have any impairment, not have any problems with interpersonal functioning. So the individual symptoms of which someone needs either four or five to meet criteria for a personality disorder are what cause the impairment that's inherent to this being a disorder. What's in the blue is just a personality type. So when someone with a pervasive pattern of detachment from social relationships and limited emotional expression, which is present even when they're interacting with people that they know really well. So it's not just because of anxiety or unfamiliarity. When someone like this um, really doesn't even want close relationships at all, doesn't feel like a part of a family or care to be, um, when they almost always choose solitary activities over activities with uh, peers, when they have little or no interest in sex with other people, um, when they take pleasure in very few activities or don't really have any hobbies, so just someone who doesn't have a lot of like positive emotion, positive affect, enjoyment of things. Someone who doesn't have any close friends, um, except sometimes they have friends who are their relatives. Someone who's really indifferent to other people's praise or criticism, just really doesn't care what other people think about them. Or experiences and expresses emotional coldness, detachment, or a flat affect. So someone like this would be totally comfortable with being alone all their life they would feel really emotionally detached and cold even towards their family members. They wouldn't really be interested in, but maybe not even really able to establish close friendships. They're not interested in other people even as um, sources of sex. In addition to this asociality, so a lack of interest in social relationships, they also experience anhedonia. So they don't really have hobbies or things that they enjoy. They, things in their life don't necessarily bring them a lot of pleasure. They also might experience flattened affect or um, affective flattening. So a lack of emotional experience and a lack of emotional expression in addition to a lack of interest in social relationships. So as I said before, um, the three cluster A disorders are on the psychosis spectrum. And really each of them re reflects attenuated or even subclinical um, psychotic symptoms. So schizoid personality disorder involves attenuated negative symptoms. So asociality, a lack of interest in social relationships, anhedonia, a lack of emotional, um, emotional range, and affect flattening, so a lack of emotional expression. All of those are negative symptoms of schizophrenia when they're present in a stable chronic way, beginning in someone's early adulthood and not getting worse over time, that's schizoid personality disorder. So paranoid personality disorder, the basic personality involves someone who's consistently distrustful and suspicious of other people and thinks that they have bad intentions, that they're out to hurt the person. Um, when someone who has this sort of distrustful personality type has following impairments, they would have paranoid personality disorder. So when someone like this suspects without having any evidence that people are exploiting, harming, or lying to them. So it's someone who's just really suspicious, but without any clear reason for being suspicious. When they're very suspicious of the loyalty of people close to them, so they think that even their friends can't be trusted, again, without any evidence. When they have a hard time confiding in other people because they don't trust them not to use that information against them. When they read hidden or threatening messages, and meanings in two relatively benign contexts. So like if someone at work were to say like, hey, your outfit looks good today, what they might read into that is that person saying like, most of the time you look terrible. Um, when they persistently hold grudges and have a hard time forgiving others for slights, and often these slights are perceived like the one, the example I just gave. So they might, might not even be holding grudges for quote unquote real reasons. Um, they perceive attacks on their character or reputation really easily. So 
just like a wrong look or an offhand comment could lead them to uh, retaliate against the person who made that comment or gave them that look in a really excessive, over the top way. Um, and they have a lot of jealous anxiety and suspicions about their romantic partner. So they're really worried that they're going to get cheated on, again, without evidence. So just like schizoid personality involves attenuated and non-psychotic negative symptoms, paranoid personality involves non-psychotic positive symptoms, just persecution and delusions of jealousy. So people with paranoid personality disorder are on the low end of the spectrum of psychotic positive symptoms related to paranoia. They don't have any um, perceptual abnormalities. They don't have attenuated hallucinations and uh, sorry, they don't have attenuated hallucinations. They only have attenuated delusions and those delusions are really only persecutory or jealous. The last cluster A personality disorder is schizoid personality disorder. And it can really be seen as kind of a combination of paranoid and schizoid personalities. So it involves social and interpersonal deficits, but rather than not wanting close relationships, people with schizoid or schizotypal personality disorder are just very uncomfortable in relationships and they have a difficult time creating and maintaining them. It doesn't mean that they fully don't want them in the way that people with schizoid personality do. They just don't really have the capacity for them. In addition to that interpersonal disturbance, they also have attenuated cognitive and perceptual distortions and attenuated disorganized behavior. So odd or eccentric behavior. And with some, when someone with this basic personality type has the following impairments, they would meet criteria for schizotypal personality disorder. So ideas of reference, and the difference between ideas of reference and delusions of reference can honestly be really hard to make. Um, an example of an idea of reference would be someone who like really believes that their horoscope is accurate. It's not that uncommon for people to kind of believe that. This would just be someone who believes it a little bit more than most people do, but doesn't believe it to like quite a literal um, rigid way that someone with psychotic delusions would. If that distinction seems like kind of fuzzy and hard to make, it's because it is. Um, but really another, like another difference between ideas of reference and delusions of reference is that ideas of reference they tend to be based on some evidence. So there is really something there, like a horoscope is really saying this is going to happen to you. It's not the same as someone who just sort of thinks that like people on TV are giving you messages. Um, it could also be someone who's like really into conspiracy theories or really into um, like paranoid ideas like that. They tend to have odd beliefs and magical thinking. So again, somewhere on the delusion spectrum, but not as extreme as a full-blown delusion. They experience unusual perceptual, uh, they have unusual perceptual experiences. They might be prone to kind of seeing flickers of things inside of their vision that aren't there, hearing their name called a lot, smelling weird smells, hearing noises that aren't voices. So this is probably, like we talked about in the psychosis lecture, related to problems with sensory dating or problems with um, how they interpret internal uh, stimuli that are happening inside their head, not outside their head. So it's the same mechanism that explains hallucinations and psychosis, but whatever is different in their brain, it's not as severe as what is different in the brains of people with schizophrenia. Um, they might have kind of odd, like tangential thinking or somewhat unusual speech, but not fully disorganized. So they're not speaking in word salad, but their ideas might run together in ways that other people's ideas don't or they might have a strange way of expressing themselves. They can be prone to suspiciousness or paranoid ideation. So similar to paranoid personality disorder, they might just not trust other people's motives, might think that other people are out to get them a little bit. They might have either inappropriate affect, so tending to like laugh and smile when they're talking about sad things or tending to have really flat constricted affect, not being able to fully express a range of emotions. They have odd or eccentric behavior or appearance. So they might just sort of stand out in the way that they act. They might dress in an unusual way. Um, they tend to lack close friends other than family members. But again, on the schizoid personality disorder, it's not because of a total disinterest. It's because of basically all of these other things that makes it difficult for them to relate to other people. And then lastly, and interestingly, people with schizotypal personality disorder have really, or can have really intense social anxiety. 
So this is kind of like social anxiety to an almost delusional degree because it doesn't go away with familiarity. These are people who are really, really anxious and afraid of doing something wrong or embarrassing themselves even in front of their families, which is not typical of um, social anxiety disorder. So for schizotypal personality disorder, it really involves a blend of positive symptoms. So odd perceptual experiences, odd beliefs, um, ideas of reference, and negative symptoms. So flattened, inappropriate, constricted affect, difficulty in social relationships. I just want to point out that if you are reading the textbook, um, personality disorders chapter, there's a figure in this chapter that's incorrect. So this slide is the correct information about the relationship between personality disorder traits and positive and negative symptoms. The table in the textbook, table 12.6 is incorrect. Okay, so as we talked about in the psychosis lecture, the cluster A personality disorders are on the same spectrum as the schizophrenia spectrum disorders. Um, it can be very difficult or impossible to distinguish cluster A personality disorders from prodromal attenuated symptoms of schizophrenia. So the way that people, the experiences and behaviors and beliefs that people have before they have their first full-blown psychotic episode, the schizophrenia prodrome. Really the only way to tell the difference between the cluster A personality disorders and the schizophrenia spectrum is whether they progress or not. So schizophrenia is a progressive disorder um, and people who will go on to develop schizophrenia, they start with attenuated prodromal symptoms, but eventually they have full-blown psychotic symptoms. People with cluster A personality disorders never have psychosis. If they do, then they're diagnosed with schizophrenia. And these two diagnoses are um, incompatible, mutually exclusive. Sorry, that was the word I was looking for. Um, another, another difference is that the schizophrenia um, spectrum, attenuated prodromal symptoms typically start to emerge in late adolescence for men and early to mid twenties for women. Um, symptoms of cluster A personality disorder often, but don't always begin earlier in life and stay stable for longer periods of time. Another difference is that someone with schizophrenia will have um, waxing and waning symptoms, where sometimes their psychotic symptoms will be much worse than other times, and sometimes their behavior might be back to their normal baseline. Um, people with cluster A personality disorders have very stable, consistent, attenuated psychotic symptoms. So again, cluster A personality disorders are all on the psychosis spectrum. Okay, so now I'm gonna go over some of the symptoms of, or the four cluster B personality disorders and their symptoms. So histrionic personality disorder um, describes someone who has a pervasive pattern of excessive emotionality. Um, so excessive displays of emotion and attention seeking behavior. People with histrionic personality disorder might feel like physically uncomfortable not being the center of attention. So kind of the opposite of an introvert in that way. Um, their interactions with other people are inappropriately seductive or their behavior is really provocative in some other way. So they might try to say really extreme things or pick fights or say really inappropriate, like insulting comments to people just to get attention. Uh, they display rapidly shifting and shallow expressions of emotion. So their emotional expression is, um, I don't wanna say fake, but it's not necessarily reflective of how they're actually feeling. They are just using emotional displays, again, for attention or for social interactive purposes, but their emotional expression doesn't match their emotional experiences. They may consistently use their appearance, so their hair and makeup or their style of dress um, to draw attention to themselves. They might also use possessions like uh, clothes or cars. They might have an odd way of speaking that's very exaggerated. So like lots of um, hyperbole, lots of exaggeration, very like concrete and black and white. So like my day was the worst day of my life. It was completely terrible. It was awful, but they wouldn't really give you any details about why that was true. So they speak in um, exaggerated generalities, but don't give a lot of detail. People like this might be very theatrical. Um, they might, it, like act in a really dramatic way, or they might tell stories that kind of have them at the center that like uh, describe a lot of drama in their lives. In addition to being rapidly shifting and shallow, so not reflecting how they really feel, their emotions might be very exaggerated and theatrical. 
histrionic uh, people might be kind of suggestible. So their mind is sort of easy to change. They're very influenced by the people around them. They're, they might be really prone to like fads or they might be um, easy to convince to do something. And they tend to consider relationships to be more intimate than they really are. So that might mean that they tell other people sort of inappropriately intimate things or they expect other people to feel closer to them than they really do. Um, oh, and for these personality disorders, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the prototypes of each of them that I chose, um, because this is related to the activity that I'm hoping you'll do, and it, again, can be a good way to understand um, personality disorders. So for history of personality disorder, for reasons that uh, we'll talk about in a couple slides, I wanted to choose a man, because this is a disorder that is stereotypically associated with women. Um, so if you've ever seen the show Shit's Creek, it's about a really wealthy family that loses their money and has to move into a motel in a small town. And they all have a very theatrical and exaggerated way of presenting themselves. They all have their own sort of unusual, exaggerated way of speaking. They all engage in shallow and rapidly shifting displays of emotions. They all act in really provocative and often sexually seductive ways. So this is just one character from that show. but. Um, an example of someone who acts like this. The next cluster B personality disorder is narcissism, which involves a pervasive pattern of grandiosity, either in someone's actual behavior or just in their fantasy life, combined with a strong need for admiration and a lack of empathy for other people. So someone with this narcissistic pattern of um, traits and behaviors might also have a very grandiose sense of their own importance. So they would exaggerate their own talents and achievements, say that they're like the best at everything they do, say that they're hugely successful and that might not be totally true. They will fantasize and dream about having extreme success, extreme wealth, extreme power, um, or really like idealized personal attractiveness, relationships with other people. Like whatever it is, it has to be the best. Um, they believe that they're special and unique and that they should get special treatment and only associate with special people or institutions. They might think that they're like too good to go to a state school so they have to go to like, you know, Dartmouth or whatever. Um, they request a lot of admiration. So they might do this just by like leading the conversation to their own achievements. They might, similar to someone with histrionic personality disorder, engage in really flamboyant um, displays of wealth, for example. Um, they feel entitled, so they expect an unreasonable amount of special treatment. They, because they lack empathy, they exploit and take advantage of other people. They lack empathy. Um, they feel a lot of, they feel jealousy a lot, and they kind of project that onto other people. They think that other people are always jealous of them. In their behavior, they tend to be kind of arrogant, haughty, aloof, um, acting too good for other people. Okay, cluster B, um, antisocial personality disorder, sorry. So this is um, someone who engages in a pervasive pattern of behavior that shows disregard for the rights and humanity of other people. This might be through repeated law breaking and serious law breaking. So not sort of socially normative ways of law breaking like underage drinking, certain kinds of drug use, Sort of like speeding or not wearing a seatbelt, this would go beyond that to more quote unquote deviant kinds of law breaking. Someone like this might be deceitful, they would lie to get what they want from others, so to con other people or just for fun, like pathological liars. People with antisocial personality disorder can be impulsive and not really planning ahead, so just do things without really thinking about the consequences. They tend to be irritable and aggressive, um, and this is demonstrated by them having a repeated pattern of getting into physical fights or assaulting people. They tend to act with a reckless disregard for safety, including the safety of other people, because again, this is a pattern of disregard for the rights of others. They tend to be irresponsible. Um, they have a hard time like paying the bills, paying the rent, paying their debts. They have a hard time holding a job. And they tend to lack remorse or not realize that they hurt other people, try to rationalize it. Um, or they might, again, they might be indifferent. So an example of this, I just wanted to play a clip from a song by Rustin Kelly that is from the perspective of someone with a lot of antisocial traits and behaviors. 
If you listen to the whole song, the chorus really describes antisocial personality disorder. Um, and the verses describe different interpersonal difficulties that someone with antisocial personality disorder might have. So the first verse described law breaking, so drunk driving, which is a kind of law breaking that is deviant and that demonstrates a lack of regard for other people. Um, impulsivity and aggressiveness, so spitting on the floor to piss off a cop without really thinking about the future and the consequences of pissing off a cop when you're being arrested. Um, so that's just, you know, an example of um, antisocial behavior. And um, in the chorus, he talks about taking advantage of other people. So um, as soon as someone is kind to him, taking advantage. And that is, again, this like deceitfulness, conning, lying to get ahead aspect of antisocial personality disorder. And that was supposed to start playing at a different point. That's why I was a little bit thrown off. So when I post these lecture slides, if you want to play the part of the song that was meant to be played, that's what will correspond to the notes in the slide. Okay. Okay, so for borderline personality disorder, this is one of the most well-known and also most heavily stigmatized personality disorders. Um, so a lot of people have heard of borderline personality disorder, but might not know exactly what it involves. It involves a pervasive pattern of instability in interpersonal relationships, instability in self-image and self-esteem, and instability in affect, so dysregulated emotion, with marked impulsivity. So someone with borderline personality disorder, one of the most common like hallmark features is efforts to avoid abandonment. So fear of being abandoned, fear of losing close relationships, and really extreme and inappropriate behaviors when they think that they're going to be abandoned in order to try to save the relationship. A pattern of unstable and intense interpersonal relationships, so having a lot of relationship drama in your life, lots of on-again, off-again relationships, lots of very intense but very short-term relationships. Um, extremes of ideal, idealization and devaluation is also called splitting, and it refers to sometimes people with borderline personality disorder will think that the people in their lives are the best and can do no wrong. They put them on a pedestal, and then sometimes they feel the opposite way, and their feelings can flip back and forth in sort of unpredictable and uncontrollable ways. People with borderline personality disorder related to this actually experience identity disturbance. So they have an unstable sense of who they are as a person um, or really unstable self-esteem. So in the trauma and dissociation lecture, I talked about how um, borderline personality disorder can sometimes be misdiagnosed as um, dissociative personality disorder or vice versa in part because it involves having this really unstable sense of self and maybe even sort of subjectively feeling like you are more than one different person, but not actually having separate experiences as different people. That would be dissociative identity disorder. So people with borderline personality disorder are impulsive and typically in ways that are harmful and self-destructive. So things like um, substance abuse, binge eating, reckless driving, um, excessive spending. People with borderline personality disorder are often suicidal. Um, these patients can be really chronically suicidal or they can engage in suicidal threats and gestures, sometimes as an effort to avoid um, losing a relationship um, or, and or they can engage in a lot of self-harming, self-injurious behaviors. And suicidality is, is basically an expression of emotional instability um, and emotion dysregulation problems in people with borderline personality disorder. So a lot of these things are just sort of inappropriate um, efforts to regulate emotion. 
because people with borderline personality disorder have what's known as affective instability, which is basically just unstable emotions. Um, their moods are extremely reactive to things that happen to them. So everyone's mood is reactive unless you're really depressed or really catatonic because it's normal for the environment to influence how you feel. But people with borderline personality disorder can go from one extreme to another really quickly in response to really minor changes in the environment. So this is someone who can go from being elated and over the moon because they had a good interaction with someone that they have a crush on to being absolutely devastated and potentially suicidal because that person didn't respond how they wanted to in the next interaction they had. So unlike um, manic and depressive episodes, which have to last two, but sorry, one week and two weeks respectively, the um, extreme moods in borderline personality disorder tend to be really short-lived, usually lasting um, a couple hours, but not more than a couple of days. People with borderline personality disorder can feel constantly empty. They sort of feel like there's this void inside of them, this like lack of a sense of self that they have to fill with um, relationships or with um, exciting, impulsive activities. Um, and then lastly, people with borderline personality disorder have also, in addition to intense like sadness and low self-esteem and fear and anxiety and happiness, they also have intense anger. And the relationship between irritability and anger and borderline personality disorder is so specific that it's actually separated from just affective instability overall. So there's really a special relationship with anger. And then lastly, people with borderline personality disorder might be prone to dissociation or mild paranoia when they're under stress. So dissociation, again, is usually associated with um, trauma, but people with borderline personality disorder are very prone to this um, trauma reaction and might have it even in response to things that aren't objectively traumatic. And that's because of um, the emotion regulation difficulties we'll talk about later in this lecture and also the fact that child abuse is very common in the history of people with borderline personality disorder. So as we talked about in the trauma and dissociation lecture, dissociation can become a conditioned response to a range of stimuli that were associated with real trauma early in life. So this could explain some of the dissociation that happens in borderline personality. So the, the prototypical example of borderline personality that I wanted to share with you is the song um, Habits by Toe Blow. I think that's how you pronounce her name. I've actually never said it out loud. Um, but basically this is a song that describes impulsive and self-destructive behavior. Um, it's implied that it's part of a pattern of unstable and intense interpersonal relationships. It discusses chronic feelings of emptiness um, and it talks about fear of abandonment. Again, the behaviors that are described here aren't necessarily, there's nothing wrong with any of it, unless it's someone's only go-to response to instability in their personal relationships. That's what's really symptomatic of borderline personality disorder. This feeling of being empty and not knowing what to do with yourself when you're separated from the person that you might be in an unstable relationship with and using a lot of reckless and potentially dangerous behaviors to try to regulate that feeling of emptiness and um, regulate your emotions in response to abandonment. Okay, so we talked about this a little bit in class and I actually collected some data from you um, to actually sort of prove this point, but the symptoms of cluster B personality disorders are gendered. This is just a fact. Um, it's known that there is gender bias in the description and diagnosis of personality disorders, especially cluster B. And the symptoms of cluster B personality disorders are really closely tied to male and female, respectively, um, gender roles. So gender roles are just behaviors or physical traits or aspects of physical appearance that are normatively linked to a society's idea of masculinity or femininity. 
And in the lecture slides, you can click this link to take a test of your alignment with masculine and feminine gender roles. Regardless of your um, gender identity, people have a range of alignment with both masculine and feminine gender roles. So one example of how there are gender differences in cluster B personality disorders is the prevalence of antisocial and borderline personality disorder diagnoses in clinic populations. So 80% of people in clinical populations who are diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder are men, and 80% of people diagnosed with borderline personality disorder are women. So this isn't to say that it's not true that mostly women have borderline and mostly men have antisocial. The point though, is that these disorders are actually more similar than they are different, but it seems very likely that borderline personality symptoms are a gendered way of expressing the same affect and emotion dysregulation that men are in our society conditioned to express through interpersonal violence and aggression. Women are conditioned to express it through um, a desire for interpersonal closeness and relationships, anger, irritability, emotional instability, and self-harm. So as an example of this and how the cluster B personality traits are gendered, I asked you guys to vote on each of the 33 cluster B personality traits and rate them on a scale where one is, the trait is very masculine, so very stereotypically linked to masculine gender roles in our society. Four is neutral, so neither linked to female or male gender roles, and seven is very feminine. And the hypothesis that I had in collecting this data from you was that the traits that are diagnostic of narcissistic personality disorder and antisocial personality disorder will on average be seen as more masculine and traits linked to histrionic personality disorder and borderline personality disorder will be seen as more feminine. So let's see what the data said. Okay, so these are the most feminine cluster B traits that you guys rated. So the, on average, um, any trait that was rated significantly higher than a four was a feminine trait and any trait that was rated significantly lower than a four was a male trait. If something was or close to four, that was a trait that most people considered relatively neutral. So the most female trait that you guys thought was um, a, a symptom of histrionic personality disorder, considering relationships more intimate or serious than they really are. The other traits that you thought were linked to feminine gender roles were um, self-esteem being up and down, trying on lots of identities and personas, that's also histrionic beauty. Using physical appearance to get attention, histrionic beauty. Theatrical and exaggerated displays of emotion, histrionic PD. Always being jealous of other people or thinking other people are jealous of them. This is actually narcissistic personality disorder. Asking for demanding praise and compliments, also narcissistic personality disorder. Although in histrionic personality disorder, people are asking for or demanding attention. Um, it's not necessarily that different. Dramatic, exaggerated, and vague conversation, histrionic. And being terrified of being abandoned, acting out and becoming upset when they think they might be abandoned. That's a trait of borderline PD. So the traits that you guys thought were the most masculine, the most masculine was being irritable and aggressive and getting into lots of physical fights. That is a trait of antisocial personality disorder. And that's really the reason why women tend not to be diagnosed with this because in our society, um, women are conditioned from a really early age to not be aggressive and not be violent and men are conditioned to be more aggressive. So, Theoretically, someone who's having the same emotional experience of intense, hard to control anger and irritability, if they are conditioned to follow male gender roles, they would be more likely to act on with violence against other people. If they're conditioned to follow female gender roles, they would have the same level of anger and emotional instability, but they would be more likely to turn it against themselves. Or to engage in what's known as relational aggression, which is aggressive behavior that's not physical, it's basically using words to hurt other people. And people with borderline personality disorder do do that a lot. That's why their relationships are unstable. Okay, so the next trait that you thought was the most masculine was very intense, hard to control anger. And that's a characteristic of both borderline and antisocial personality disorders. Repeated law breaking and rule breaking, also antisocial. Thinking really highly of yourself, bragging about or exaggerating your talents and achievements, that's narcissism. Reckless disregard for own or other safety. Again, that is an antisocial personality disorder trait, but people with borderline personality disorder display this too. It just tends to focus more on disregard for their own safety. Being impulsive, not thinking about future consequences of their actions. Again, that's a trait that is from the criteria for antisocial personality disorder, but people with borderline personality disorder engage in impulsive self-destructive behavior too. Lacking empathy for other people, 
that is a trait of both narcissism and antisocial personality disorder. And then lacking remorse or making excuses for hurting other people is a trait of antisocial personality disorder. So as you guys can see from the way that you voted, um, the hypothesis was that narcissistic and antisocial traits would be seen as more masculine and histrionic and borderline traits would be seen as more feminine. And that basically is what the results showed. So the traits that you guys thought were the most masculine were mostly antisocial and also narcissistic. But again, most of the traits that are linked to antisocial personality disorder have equivalent traits in borderline personality disorder. They're just described and expressed a little bit differently in really gender studies. By far the most feminine traits were histrionic personality disorder, um, as well as a couple borderline personality disorder traits. So the results of your opinion poll, um, which traits do you think are masculine and feminine, kind of supports this idea that the diagnostic criteria for the cluster B personality disorder sort of break down on gender lines. And someone who has a lot of female gender roles, who's socialized according to female gender roles, might express the same unstable self-esteem and desire for praise as histrionic, whereas a man might express that as narcissistic because men, as you guys said in class, are expected to be independent and successful and they're expected to be financial providers. Whereas women, as you said in class, are more expected to wear makeup, wear dresses, um, be emotional, so histrionic. Similarly, the Emotional experiences involved in borderline and antisocial personality disorder, as we'll talk about later in this lecture, can be pretty much fully overlapping. One of the main differences is the way that aggression is expressed. And aggression is expressed against other people in antisocial personality disorder. Impulsivity and carelessness about life and safety is applied both to the self and others. Whereas in borderline personality disorder, aggression tends to be either physical aggression directed inward or relational aggression directed at relationship partners. And um, reckless impulsive behavior tends to only hurt themselves. But if you want my opinion, um, the way that the DSM describes these disorders, they really are the same disorder, but one is a more feminine expression and one is a more masculine expression. Okay, so cluster C personality disorders. There's three of these, we're getting to the end. So dependent personality is um, a pervasive need to be taken care of. So feeling like you can't really be okay, can't be safe, can't exist without support and care from other people. And that tends to lead to really submissive clingy behavior and intense fear of separation. So the prototype I chose for this was the song, A Boyfriend by Justin Bieber. And I'm not gonna play it because I think it's kind of annoying, but, um, Actually, the way that I got there was through the overly attached girlfriend meme. I don't know if this, this meme might be a little bit before your guys' time, but that meme really sort of demonstrates how cluster C personality disorders are a little bit gendered too, um, because she was actually making fun of the song Boyfriend, but she became a meme and the context of that was kind of stripped away and now she's just kind of used to exemplify clingy girlfriends. Anyway. Someone with dependent personality disorder um, might have a lot of difficulty making everyday decisions without input from other people. They might need a lot of reassurance that they're doing the right thing. They want other people to take responsibility for their life and choices. They don't wanna to have to make decisions themselves. They have a hard time disagreeing with other people. So even if they do have an opinion or feel like their rights aren't being respected, they would have a hard time expressing that. They have a difficult time initiating projects on their own. Um, they might go to really extreme lengths to get support or get validation or nurturance. So someone who might like pretend that their car broke down or pretend to be sick because they just feel like they need to be taken care of for a minute. When alone, they would feel really anxious and helpless, again, because they have this belief that they can't make decisions, can't take responsibility, can't do things on their own. They tend to be serial monogamists, so they will go from one serious relationship to another because they have this fear of being on their own. And again, they have an extreme fear of abandonment, really don't want to have to take care of themselves, don't want to be left alone. Okay, so cluster C avoidant personality. Um, this is a pervasive pattern of social inhibition and feeling inadequate, and also being hypersensitive to rejection or judgment. So someone like this might avoid all responsibilities that involve interpersonal contact, so they might take a job that involves being solitary or working from home, even if it's not the job that they want to do because they don't want to have to deal with other people at work. Or they might um, 
like not want to be the one to drop off their kid at school and have their spouse do it because they don't want to have to talk to the teachers or other parents at school. Um, they might be unwilling to engage in social activities if they're not sure that they'll be liked. If there's any chance that they might be judged or rejected, they just won't do it. Even in intimate relationships, they might act a little bit restrained and they might be sensitive to or afraid of um, rejection or ridicule by like their parents, their siblings, their romantic partner, their children. That makes it different and more extreme than social anxiety disorder, where people with social anxiety disorder are usually most comfortable with their family and friends. And they really don't usually have any symptoms of social anxiety disorder in those close relationships. People with avoidant personality disorder have symptoms of social anxiety, even in their close relationships. But thinking back to schizotypal personality disorder, it's not that extreme. Um, someone with schizotypal personality disorder might act like shy and selectively mute with their own parents. Someone with avoidant personality disorder would definitely act more comfortable with their parents than they would with other people, but they would still be hypersensitive to criticism and be worried that they would be rejected or ridiculed. So they're really worried about the possibility of being criticized or rejected. They tend to be very inhibited, not surprisingly, in interpersonal situations because they have all these worries going on. Um, they have really negative self-image and low self-esteem. They think of themselves as socially inept, but also they think of themselves as not even really someone that anyone would want to hang out with. And they're reluctant to like put themselves out there, do risky things, do anything fun that might end up being embarrassing. So this would be like someone who won't go on the rides at the amusement park because they don't want to like scream on the roller coaster and have people think they look stupid or something like that. All right, last one. Um, Obsessive compulsive personality. So I found an archetypal person for this. I don't know if you guys have seen The Good Place. I would recommend it. But the character Chidi for sure has obsessive compulsive personality disorder. It's kind of his whole thing that he's very morally rigid. He has a lot of trouble making decisions because he has he feels like every decision he makes has to be the right, perfect decision. And he's very preoccupied with ethics and morality. But obsessive compulsive personality is a pervasive preoccupation with orderliness, perfectionism, and control. So self-control being like really aesthetic, um, not indulging in like overeating or using substances or having like a really perfect diet, having a really perfect like sleep schedule, always drinking the right amount of water, always taking 10,000 steps. Really extreme self-control, but also wanting to control other people. And this comes at the expense of being flexible, being open to new experiences, being efficient sometimes. So this is a personality that's basically super high in conscientiousness, very low in openness, and also low in agreeableness, as well as high in neuroticism. People with OCPD are really preoccupied with like small details of activities or the rules or making like to-do lists or organizing things. And this preoccupation comes at the expense of actually enjoying the activities that they're so preoccupied with planning and organizing. Their perfectionism can also make it hard to finish tasks. So the character of Chidi in this show um, is an ethics professor, but he never finished his dissertation because he just kept writing and writing and wanting it to be perfect to the point where it was like extremely long and unreadable. Um, someone like this might be excessively devoted to work and productivity. So they might be someone who works like 90 hours a week all, every day, every week, and neglects their family at home. Or they might be someone who like never takes a vacation from work, never takes a sick day. They might be overly conscientious and inflexible about morality. So this might be someone who insists on always driving the speed limit, even on a highway where other people are going like 20 miles above the speed limit. They would drive 50, even if trucks were passing them and people were honking at them. Um, they might be really preoccupied with ethics, so they might have really like rigid ideas for what makes someone a good person and not want to associate with anyone that they think is a bad person. They often have trouble throwing things away. So just feeling like it's hard to make a decision about what to get rid of because you might need something later. They have a really hard time delegating responsibilities. So they just kind of do everything themselves. This might be someone who insists on doing all the chores in the house because they think that their partner doesn't do them right, but then also gets kind of resentful of their partner for not doing their chores. Um, they tend to be kind of stingy with money, so unwilling to spend money on themselves, like they'll, they might wear the same clothes until they like fall apart. If they have kids, they might be reluctant to spend money to buy them new clothes for the school year or to pay for them to go on field trips or something like that. And they tend to be really rigid and stubborn. Whoops. Okay. So according to the splitting theory of personality disorders, cluster C personality disorders are basically 
extreme manifestations of anxiety symptom disorders, whereas cluster A personality disorders are mild manifestations of psychotic symptoms. Cluster C personality disorders are extreme manifestations of anxiety. So we talked about this in class, but basically, oops, um, basically dependent personality is an extreme manifestation of separation anxiety disorder. Remember, separation anxiety disorder is a disorder of not wanting to be apart from your loved ones because you're worried that something bad will happen to them or you while you're apart. With dependent personality disorder, that preoccupation is basically like turned up to 100. Similarly, avoidant personality disorder is very extreme social anxiety disorder. So this figure here is kind of flipped around from the way it was on the cluster A slides, where the symptom disorder, social anxiety disorder, is actually the more common and more mild manifestation of the trait of social anxiety. And avoidant personality disorder is the rare and extreme manifestation. And then lastly, um, in the next couple of lectures, we're going to be talking about obsessive compulsive disorder. But obsessive compulsive personality disorder is, in some ways, an extreme manifestation of obsessive compulsive traits. Okay, so the activity that we're going to do in class, just to like introduce it a little bit now. For some of the personality disorders, I found fictional characters or um, songs that are like archetypes of that personality trait. So for most of next class, those of you who come to class are gonna do an activity where you're broken into eight groups and each group has to find a couple archetypes of their personality disorder and explain what um, criteria they need. Hopefully this will be a way that you guys can all contribute to something that you can study for next exam. Okay, so now we're gonna get into the splitting theory of cluster B. So we don't really need to go into a ton of detail for cluster A and cluster C because we already covered psychotic spectrum disorders and anxiety disorders. But what group of symptom disorders do cluster B disorders most resemble? Well, except for a couple of childhood disorders that we will talk about, they really don't. There aren't non-personality disorder diagnoses for people who have problems with emotion regulation that go beyond basically anxiety and depression. Because anxiety and depression are disorders of emotion regulation, just specific emotions. Um, the cluster B personality disorders are disorders of interpersonal emotion, sorry, of emotion like broadly. So all emotional experiences are dysregulated, not just one, and not just in certain contexts, but pretty pervasively. And also because personality disorders involve interpersonal difficulties, the types of um, emotion regulation that tends to be most impaired is interpersonal emotion regulation and emotion regulation in interactions with other people. So what is emotion regulation? So first, as we've talked about in this class already, um, emotions are very influential in our day-to-day lives. Um, our cognitions of the things that we think tend to be congruent with our emotional state. Emotions influence our physiology. Um, the feeling of happiness is really just a chemical experience in the body. Fear, similarly, HPA axis activation, cortisol in the blood. Emotions also influence behavior. So some emotions promote, uh, promote avoidance, like fear and anxiety. Some emotions promote approach behaviors, like happiness, but also anger. It just is a more aggressive approach. But emotions are very, very influential. So being able to regulate them and manage them is a really important skill for healthy adults. And it's a skill that healthy children are learning as they get older. So one of the first steps in regulating emotions is just recognizing them. So there's a construct called alexithymia, which is a difficulty labeling your own emotions. So a difficulty knowing what emotion it is that you're experiencing. People with emotion regulation deficits might have a really hard time actually describing their feelings. They're feeling something. They could maybe say that it feels good or bad, but they couldn't really tell you more than that. They couldn't tell you if they're feeling sad or if they're feeling angry. So as a result of that, because emotions influence cognition, physiology, and behavior, their cognitions and behavior might seem really disorganized because they don't seem to fit with the emotion that you would think that they're feeling. It could be because they don't really know what they're feeling. People with emotion dysregulation may also have difficulty recognizing and naming other people's emotions too, which can interfere with empathy. Emotion regulation also involves identifying the triggers for emotions, so knowing that like this type of situation always makes me feel anxious. This type of situation always makes me feel sad and managing those triggers. So knowing like, okay, I feel really awful today. I've had a very rough day. I should not watch the last episode of The Good Place because it will make me too sad. That's a true experience. Um, 
people with emotion regulation problems also might have difficulty handling strong emotions when they're feeling them. So not knowing what to do with all of those physiological changes that emotions bring about and their emotions might be more intense than other people's emotions and they might last longer. So whatever physiological changes are happening in the body, they're bigger. And because they're bigger, they're more, they're more long lasting. And then lastly, part of emotion regulation is having emotions, but not letting them influence your behavior. So yes, being scared makes you want to avoid, but you can choose not to. Being angry makes you want to attack someone, or if you have borderline personality to sort of hurt yourself, but you don't have to. Being able to have an emotion but not engage in the behavior that's associated with that emotion is an important part of emotion regulation. So what is interpersonal emotion regulation? Basically, it's using relationships with other people to help you manage your emotions. It also has to do with the emotions that other people um, cause you to have. So one aspect of interpersonal emotion regulation is looking to other people for comfort, help, having other people help you manage your negative feelings, or helping having other people help you manage your positive feelings. So being around other people and you're happy magnifies the good feelings. Um, or in some cases, like getting praise and attention from other people might magnify your self-esteem. That's a form of interpersonal emotion regulation. Okay, so over these next several slides, I'm gonna talk about borderline personality disorder, narcissistic personality disorder, and antisocial personality disorder. There is very little research on histrionic personality disorder, maybe because it's a disorder more associated with women. Who can say? Okay, so emotion dysregulation is the core of borderline personality disorder. It's really the main deficit that causes the suffering that people with borderline personality disorder experience. And these are posts on Reddit from real people who are self or professionally diagnosed with borderline personality disorder. So one person says, I literally can't stand feeling embarrassed. It's so, so overwhelming for me. I'll freak out and want to die. I know that explosion probably comes off as overreacting, but the shame I feel in my core is just too much. If I'm embarrassed, I'll shut down, panic, and overheat, and it, makes, it takes me hours, if not the whole day, to get me back to feeling all right. I don't know why it hits so hard, but it really, really sucks to endure. So this is an example of extreme emotion dysregulation, um, having emotions that are more powerful than other people and that last a lot longer than other people. Um, every day, I'll get myself into a complete frenzy over something completely fictitious. I'll be feeling kind of lonely and the thought pops up in my head like your friends hate you and my brain will run with it. And I'll play out an entire event where everyone yells at me and tells me I'm horrible. I sit in bed and actually feel really mad or sad at that person, even though I completely made the entire thing up. So again, really strong emotions in response to a trigger that for most people wouldn't trigger such powerful emotional responses. And those emotions take a really long time to go away and they really influence um, behavior. Okay, so when we talk about emotion dysregulation and borderline personality disorder, we're actually gonna be talking about a new kind of emotion regulation and a new kind of um, physiology of emotion that we've talked about before. So we've talked before about how anxiety disorders are disorders of the sympathetic nervous system. There are people whose fight or flight response goes off in response to inappropriate cues, like someone with specific phobia or someone with panic disorder having an extreme fear reaction in response to really nothing in the environment. The sympathetic nervous system controls what's known as the fight or flight response. And we talked about this in the PTSD lecture too. But both of these are behavioral responses to danger. And they are both adaptive and highly conserved because they promoted our ancestors' survival. They're mediated by the parasympathetic nervous system. So when we're threatened, our body reacts by activating the sympathetic nervous system. We, breathe, we start to breathe faster, our heart beats harder. Blood goes to our extremities and away from our digestive system, our pupils dilate. We might like release our bladders to make it easier to run or fight. In the PTSD lecture, we also talked about the freeze response in the context of dissociation. So it turns out that the freeze response is actually not controlled by the sympathetic nervous system. It's actually controlled by the parasympathetic nervous system. So before in this class, I've talked about the parasympathetic nervous system as the rest and digest branch of the nervous system. It's the branch of the nervous system that's usually in control. Um, it's in control during resting state functions. And it's supposed to work quickly to bring back um, control away from the sympathetic nervous system as soon as the danger has passed. So another way that people with anxiety disorders can experience impairment is having inadequate parasympathetic, 
control over the fight or flight response. So their parasympathetic nervous system is not good at coming back online after they've had a fight or flight response. But the parasympathetic nervous system um, is basically, if an organism is like unconscious, not alert, not moving around a lot, it's parasympathetic nervous system is probably activated rather than the sympathetic nervous system. So the freeze response is a response that animals have to unavoidable, inescapable danger. It's kind of like a last ditch effort to survive um, when fighting or running away is not an option. So the freeze response represents what's known as, well, so the parasympathetic nervous system, its job is to regulate the sympathetic nervous system, but it, it can do this by completely taking over control as it does in resting state functions, or it can do this by what's known as putting a break on the sympathetic nervous system. So when the parasympathetic nervous system takes over, it does so through one of two branches. The first branch of the parasympathetic nervous system is known as the dorsal vagal complex. And both of these um, go through the vagus nerve, which is a nerve that we've talked about in the context of serotonin and gut-brain communication. Um, but the hard break on the sympathetic nervous system is the dorsal vagal complex. This is what happens when someone is extremely anxious, they're in a fight or flight response, their parasympathetic, their, their sympathetic nervous system is active. And then all of a sudden, the danger becomes too intense or too inescapable, and they freeze, they dissociate. Or this might be someone who has a phobia of blood and they're really afraid and anxious going into the doctor's appointment, but then as soon as they see that blood, they immediately pass out. Um, so dorsal vagal activation, instead of fight, fight, or flee, fight, fight, or freeze, dorsal vagal activation is also known as the freeze faint fragment response. So freeze. Um, or like what this possum is doing, tonic immobility or playing dead, faint, so completely pass out, lose consciousness, um, slow down the heart rate so that if you're bleeding, you don't bleed out as fast, and fragment, so dissociating, kind of your mind goes elsewhere and you are sort of spared from experiencing this. The dorsal vagal complex is activated when an organism is in intense danger, maybe already injured, maybe a predator is like already chewing on them. It works to preserve um, the organism's life as a last ditch effort. So if an animal is in the sympathetic, is having a sympathetic activation, sympathetic response, it means that the heart is beating really fast and it's sending a lot of blood into their extremities. But once an animal is wounded, this response is not adaptive anymore. And so the dorsal vagal complex takes over and just puts like a hard stop to all that activity. So it's kind of like unplugging the computer. It just shuts it down right away. Okay. So the other branch of the parasympathetic nervous system is the ventral vagal complex. So if using this brake metaphor, if the dorsal vagal complex is like an emergency brake where you just pull it and everything screeches to a halt, the ventral vagal complex is like covering the brake. So it's like when you're driving, your foot is over the brake pedal all the time and you're not accelerating because you're always ready to brake when you have to. But you're not on the brake, you're not riding the brake, you're just ready to brake. That's kind of what the um, ventral vagal complex does. And basically what this means is that this, the parasympathetic nervous system, when it's fully activated, usually it's when an organism is completely at rest, when it feels completely safe, when it's totally alone often, or when it's in the company of um, really safe people, like your own offspring or your own partner. There's a lot of activities that we engage in that require some level of arousal, but not too much arousal. So sometimes the sympathetic nervous system is active, but we're not in full fight or flight. This, is, this happens when we're feeling positive stress. So when we're doing a task that's really hard and mentally taxing and really important to us, but we're doing it, we're enjoying ourselves, we're feeling good about our work. Or it can be activated when we're excited. Other times it's activated are, for example, when two members of the same species are playing with each other. When you look at how animals play, it often looks a lot like fighting. And animals are constantly regulating their behavior to really toe the line between playing and fighting because playing has an adaptive function, but you want to be careful not to flip over into full fight or flight response and start fighting with someone that you're playing with. A human equivalent of this kind of covering the break activity would be certain types of social interaction. So this is a still from Mean Girls where 
Lindsay Lohan's character is in a high stake social interaction where things are a little bit ambiguous and the threat level is kind of uncertain. So probably what's happening is that she's experiencing a lot of sympathetic nervous system activation, but her ventral vagal complex is simultaneously active to keep her sympathetic arousal high, but not so high that she panics or gets aggressive. So the ventral vagal complex covering the break of the sympathetic nervous system is really important to adaptive functioning in interpersonal contexts, especially sort of high stakes, potentially threatening or really exciting interpersonal contexts. Okay, so mostly I'm just gonna ask you to take my word for it that in people with borderline personality disorder, the physiological dysregulation is not happening at the sympathetic arousal level. So unlike someone with anxiety disorder, people with borderline personality disorder don't experience emotional dysregulation because their sympathetic nervous system is overly active. They experience emotional dysregulation because their basal vagal um, complex, their parasympathetic nervous system is not active enough. But specifically, it's the basal vagal complex that's not active enough. Um, people with borderline personality disorder are prone to dissociating, which could mean that their dorsal vagal complex is overly active. They're more likely to go into the freeze and fragment defenses um, more easily or more readily than other people. So this is one demonstration of how this is true. People with borderline personality disorder have inadequate basal vagal control of the sympathetic nervous system. So what's being shown on this figure is heart period activity. And essentially heart period is a measure of um, nerve activity in the uh, vagus nerve that helps to regulate heart rate. So whether heart rate is high or low, someone who has high heart period activity has a lot of parasympathetic control over heart rate. If someone has low heart period, it means that their sympathetic nervous system is fully in control of their heart rate. So, having a low level of heart period, having a low heart period rather, shows that you have a low level of basal vagal activity, a low level of parasympathetic control over sympathetic arousal. So this is, these are the results from an experiment where patients with borderline personality disorder, so the circles and control people, so people who don't have a disorder, the squares, were shown three films. And the films depicted intense, upsetting, scary interpersonal interactions because these are the kinds of interactions that tend to cause the most emotion dysregulation for people with borderline personality disorder. People with borderline PD tend to mostly experience extreme highs and lows of emotion in response to social interactions. So these are just examples of scenes from movies that show intense interpersonal interactions, um, an abusive parent or a really intense relationship fight. These are the kinds of films that patients were watching. So, they were shown three different films and their heart period activity was measured each time they were shown a film. And the hypothesis was that controls would show elevated heart period activity because they were experiencing a lot of sympathetic arousal from these films. Both borderline patients and controls experienced similar physiological arousal. The films were equally upsetting to both groups. Where they differed though, is for controls who are watching these upsetting movies, the more they watched these movies, the more heart period activity they had. So the more their parasympathetic nervous system came online and tried to regulate their sympathetic nervous system. For patients, their heart period activity actually went down. It shows that their sympathetic arousal was taking over. So what happened by the end, they had opposite trajectories of ventral vagal activity. And by the end, the controls were experiencing high levels of basal vagal control over their sympathetic nervous system. So they were in a more affiliated mood. They were able to engage in social interactions without um, basically flying off the handle. Whereas patients with borderline personality disorder were in fight or flight mode. Their sympathetic nervous systems were active. They were feeling really intense emotion, probably fear and distress. I was gonna say something else. Shoot, well, I don't remember, but basically this is just one demonstration that shows that in response to intense interpersonal interactions, people with borderline personality disorder experience extreme sympathetic arousal and inadequate control over their sympathetic nervous system. And what can happen is that when sympathetic arousal gets too intense and too high, then your dorsal vagal complex will come in and take over and you'll freeze or you'll dissociate or you'll faint. So people with borderline personality disorder could be getting to the 
the level of arousal where they would actually dissociate or actually cry um, because of this intense emotion provoked by these videos. Oh, what I was gonna say is the reason that the, the basal vagal complex seems to be taking over in patients with people without BPD is that cognitively they know that these are just movies, they're not really happening. So they're because they consciously know that they don't need to defend themselves or flee, their basal vagal um, complex is taking over so they can remain in this interaction without it needing to escape it. Okay, so a summary. The key psychopathology, or one of the key pathologies in borderline personality disorder is inadequate parasympathetic control over sympathetic arousal. Unlike anxiety, where sympathetic arousal itself is the problem, in borderline PD, it's control over sympathetic arousal. The system that's impaired is the one that's responsible for maintaining an appropriate level of arousal during social interactions. So not too high and not too low. Failing to manage sympathetic arousal can lead to extreme fluctuations in arousal and emotion. And because, these, because um, the system that's involved in this is evolved to help us manage social interactions, people with borderline personality disorder are most often triggered by social situations. So there is more to borderline personality disorder than just emotion regulation. Um, and in fact, emotion regulation is one of three symptom clusters in borderline personality disorder. Um, the other one has, is relationship instability and impulsivity. And impulsivity is a separate um, form of psychopathology and it has separate like physiological and neural correlate than emotion dysregulation does. Um, but emotion dysregulation is really what ties together the three cluster B personality, or the four cluster B personality disorders. See, I almost forgot about the strand personality disorder. It's, I've never seen someone with it. I've seen patients with every other personality disorder. Anyway, too much editorializing, I'm sorry. Narcissistic personality disorder. Okay, so I borrowed a lot of these slides from Josh Foster, who is a professor in our department. He's an expert on narcissism. And he's um, one of our two guest lectures for this, these two lectures. Um, but narcissism is actually a complex personality trait that's, that has two distinct flavors and that's made up of three ingredients. So we're gonna go over what the three ingredients are. Um, but basically this is just showing that narcissism as a concept is an umbrella definition that encompasses two flavors of narcissism. And these two flavors of narcissism are made up of three different personality traits. So the first personality trait that's common to both flavors of narcissism, without this trait you don't have narcissism, is self-centered antagonism. So this involves being manipulative and exploiting other people. So someone who would say that I'm really good at manipulating other people, it's okay to take advantage of other people to get what you need. This is someone who's entitled and arrogant. They think that they deserve special treatment. They, they brag a lot, but they think it's just telling the truth. They don't think it's bragging. They lack empathy. They don't worry about other people. They are reactive and distrustful. They think everyone is out to get them. They get really upset and dysregulated when they think they've been mistreated. Um, and also they tend to be thrill and sensation seeking. So they enjoy engaging in activities that are really stimulating and exciting. Agentic extroversion is the specifier for the flavor known as grandiose narcissism. So this is someone who is self-centered and antagonistic, and also they aspire to greatness, they fantasize about being powerful and important, they like to be in charge, they're authoritative, and they're exhibitionistic, they like to be the center of attention. All of these are traits of extroversion, and without self-centered antagonism, they're not really disordered. This is just what someone who's extroverted might be like. On the other side is neuro narcissistic neuroticism. So again, without self-centered antagonism, someone who has these traits wouldn't be considered narcissistic. But in the context of someone who is who thinks that they're the most important person, doesn't care about other people, manipulates and uses other people to get ahead, brags about their achievements, when that person also experiences a lot of shame, so being really devastated and ashamed when they fail at something, when they need a lot of validation, so really caring what other people think of them, when they need a lot of admiration, so they feel like they need to be complimented by other people in order to feel all right about themselves. That is narcissistic neuroticism. So some takeaways from, from this trait model of narcissism. There are two flavors of both trait level narcissism, which again is that spectrum that all of us are on. 
and narcissistic personality disorder, which is the far end of that spectrum. The core trait is what makes narcissistic personality disorder a disorder. It has, it's the reason that people with narcissism have poor interpersonal functioning. So <clears throat> self-centered antagonism involves low empathy, aggression and difficulties regulating emotion, being manipulative, being airy, and being impulsive and thrill seeking. Okay, so the mask model of narcissism. This is kind of a psychology myth that you might've heard before, but the idea is that people who act really narcissistic are secretly really ashamed, really have low self-esteem. Um, they're just putting on front and pretending to be really sure of themselves and really grandiose when really they always feel small, they always feel insecure, they always feel ashamed. And I tried to find examples of this and I actually couldn't find a lot of great examples, but I definitely have seen a lot of people say this about Donald Trump, that his shows of grandiosity and narcissism are really just concealing the fact that he knows that he's not that great, that he knows he wasn't smart enough to get into Penn, that he knows he was, um, well, that he knows that he is less qualified than other people to be president. Unfortunately, um, there's really no evidence that this is true. So grandiose narcissists like Donald Trump don't have chronically low self-esteem. They actually do have really high self-esteem. If you ask them how they feel about themselves, they will say that they feel great about themselves. And modern psychology really takes people at, at face value like that. But what they do have is unstable reactive self-esteem where their self-esteem in the moment is high or low, depending on what just happened to them. It's high or low, depending on how much validation and praise they're getting, how much attention they're getting, how much recognition they're getting. So it's not so much that narcissism is a mask for chronically low self-esteem, but basically narcissism is an expression of unstable self-esteem because narcissists are people who use praise and attention from other people in order to keep their self-esteem high. It wouldn't stay high without that. So narcissists have unstable, fragile self-esteem that depends on validation and praise, and that is reactive to failures and setbacks. Now, the type of failures and setbacks that cause self-esteem to plummet for narcissists, that varies according to what's important to that person. So someone who's really invested in like performing well at work um, and is narcissistic might have their self-esteem plummet if their boss yells at them or if they like fail to get some project done on time. Whereas someone who takes a lot of pride in being like irresistible to the opposite sex might experience a big hit to their self-esteem if they get rejected. Um, but no matter what the reason for someone's self-esteem plummeting, unstable self-esteem is really associated with reactive aggression, which is a key part of self-centered antagonism in narcissism. So really narcissism isn't a mask for low self-esteem, but it is a disorder of self-esteem regulation. People with narcissism can't intrinsically regulate their own self-esteem, so they rely on other people to regulate it for them. So narcissism itself isn't inherently bad. Um, and without self-centered antagonism, it's not really disordered. So on its own, agentic extroversion is actually linked to high self-esteem and not fragile self-esteem. People who are like who are agentic extroverts. They feel good about themselves and that good feeling isn't really dependent on what's happening in the moment. They just have a core stable self-esteem. Um, agentic extroversion doesn't predict having interpersonal problems and it doesn't predict having poor emotion regulation skills. Um, having fragile self-esteem does predict poor emotion regulation skills. Um, I don't know how clear this figure is, but the better than average effect is basically a universal cognitive bias that everyone has where no matter what the task, if something is important to us, we think that we're better than average at it. So on average, people actually think that they are in the 75th percentile for most things. So for an example, um, most people think that they're good drivers. And if you ask, more than 50% of people will say that they're a better than average driver, which is impossible because more than 50% of people can't be above average at something. This figure is actually showing the interaction between the normative better than average effect, which everyone has, and traits that are um, of high personal importance to the person. Also traits that are of um, high cultural importance. So this is basically just saying that when 
it's when a trade is important to us, when we think a trade is positive, or when our culture tells us that a trade is valuable, we're more likely to think that we have that trade. We're more likely to think that we're better than average at that trade. And this isn't inherently unhealthy. It's not even necessarily, it doesn't lead to like unrealistic behavior. It just is a way that people sort of maintain a stable high self esteem. And there's nothing inherently wrong with it. Okay. So narcissism can also exist at a population level. Um, you can go so far as to say that a whole culture is narcissistic. So in nationally representative studies conducted in the United States and Europe, compared to Asia and the Middle East, trait levels of narcissism on average are higher in Americans and Europeans who are living in individualistic cultures. Group level narcissism depends on shared values and norms that make narcissism a beneficial trait in that society. So individualistic societies value competition, they value individual achievement relative to group achievement, and they value wealth and success. These societies also tend to be really capitalistic. Collectivistic societies value cooperation, communalism, being a member of a family, fitting into your group. So these are societies where being narcissistic is a less beneficial trait. So people on average in these societies tend to have lower levels of narcissism. They're basically taught from a young age not to be narcissistic because personality is personality is never fixed, but it's not even stable until adulthood. So you can also go so far as to say that a gender is relatively more narcissistic than other genders. In class on Thursday, you guys gave some examples of stereotypical male norms. And among those were being independent and being a provider and being um, successful at work. And all of these traits are sort of um, socialized into boys and men from a young age. And all of these traits are linked to narcissism. So this isn't saying that men are like more likely to be narcissists, than men, but just on average, men have higher levels of narcissism. And that's very closely linked to gender norms in our society. You also might notice from this figure that young people tend to be more narcissistic than older people, although there's likely a cohort effect here um, with older baby boomers. The men are more narcissistic. But this tendency of younger people to be more narcissistic has been noticed for a really long time. So this is a quote from Aristotle, you said that young people are high-minded because they haven't yet been humbled by life and they haven't experienced the force of circumstances. So this is kind of just saying the older you get, the more you realize that you're not the greatest thing on earth, that you're not that different from other people, and that you need other people to be happy. But it's normal for younger people to be more narcissistic and more self-centered. So this is a really interesting figure that I got from Dr. Foster. Um, so this is based on data that he's collected here at South. So you maybe have heard the stereotype that millennials are a really self-absorbed, self-obsessed generation. Um, they actually weren't the first generation to be called this. Well, the first generation to be called that was the baby boomers, but really the generation that got consistently called self-centered and narcissistic was generation X, which, you know, I don't know this offhand. Oh, you know what, I do. it's people who were born between, I think 1966 and 1980, right? Yeah, so um, these data come from when they were in college. So when they were young adults, ages 18 to 22. So as you can see over the um, 80s and 90s, average trait levels of narcissism were increasing in college students. And that increase continued into my generation of millennials and it peaked in 2008, which was the year that Barack Obama was elected. It was um, also the year of the Great Recession. So economic conditions that had been brewing all of these years finally hit a breaking point where the economy crashed. And immediately after the, the economic crash in 2008, what followed was a sharp decrease in narcissism among millennials. So among young adults who are just entering the workforce during this um, economic depression. Starting around 2013, um, the economy was improving and it seems like narcissism levels were starting to increase too. But again, beginning in 2016, which was consistent with the election of Donald Trump and also a lot of economic and just sort of future oriented anxiety among younger people, narcissism levels started to go down again. And this didn't just happen at South Alabama, it happened at universities all over the country. Um, a dip in narcissism 
triggered by an economic recession. And what this is really showing is that narcissism at a societal level is really closely connected to capitalism. When a capitalistic economy is working well, when people think that they'll be able to support themselves without a lot of help, when people think that they don't need the government or other people to rely on for a safety net or for um, financial security for the rest of their lives, it makes them more narcissistic. And when like my generation realized that the economic future didn't look great for us, and it continues to not look great for your generation, narcissism levels have plummeted and they've stayed low. Okay, so some takeaways from narcissism. The core of pathological narcissism is self-centered entitlement, which encompasses selfishness, low empathy, being entitled, being manipulative, also being aggressive and impulsive. There's two flavors of narcissistic personality disorder. Vulnerable narcissists are really sensitive to um, praise and success. Their self-esteem is really obviously reactive. They'll get really upset and really aggressive and really emotionally dysregulated when they feel like they're not being respected and they need a lot of praise and validation. Grandiose narcissists also have unstable self-esteem, but they tend to be the ones who are a lot more um, manipulative, a lot more Oh, sorry, they're the ones who are a lot more achievement oriented, a lot more flashy and showy, um, who get a lot more of their self-esteem from accomplishments and from like, material wealth. And although their self-esteem is still reactive, they might need less interpersonal regulation of self-esteem because they get their regulation of self-esteem from things and from success. Both flavors of narcissism involve unstable self-esteem at their core. So this is the way that narcissism is related to emotion regulation. At a trait level, so thinking about countries, society, generations, and genders, people who are more narcissistic belong to groups, so whether that's a gender or a culture or a generation, that have more values around individualism, more expectation of financial success, more they place more value on wealth and financial success, and male gender roles are more emphasized. Okay. Antisocial personality disorder. Okay, so before we talk about the emotion regulation components of anti antisocial personality disorder, I do want to talk about how antisocial personality disorder does connect to what DSM considers symptom disorders. And I think this kind of just helps to illustrate how arbitrary the distinction between personality disorders and symptom disorders can be. So, Antisocial personality disorder, like all personality disorders, can only be diagnosed in adults. But in children who have a lot of impulsivity and irritability and misbehavior, um, there is the diagnosis of oppositional defiant disorder. And then for children and adolescents who engage in pretty much the same behaviors that adults with antisocial personality behavior engage in, there's the diagnosis of conduct disorder. In addition to these diagnoses, just to pause for one second, in the mood disorders lectures, we talked about disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. And in response to some questions about what happens to people with that disorder, which can only be diagnosed between ages six and 18 when they turn 18 and become adults, we also talked a little bit about intermittent explosive disorder, which is a similar disorder where people just sort of fly into fits of rage really easily and with minimal provocation. Um, both disruptive mood dysregulation disorder and intermittent explosive disorder are disorders of mood dysregulation just like oppositional defiant disorder, conduct disorder, and antisocial personality disorder. And just like borderline personality disorder, narcissistic personality disorder, and histrionic personality disorder. So the DSM does recognize symptom disorders that are disorders of mood dysregulation, but all of these, oppositional defiant disorder, conduct disorder, disruptive mood dysregulation disorder, and intermittent explosive disorder, the only dysregulated emotion that the DSM emphasizes and the only one that can be used towards the diagnosis is dysregulation of anger and aggression. So unlike borderline personality disorder, which is like dysregulation of basically all emotions, um, these disorders really focus on anger. So the main difference between ODD and conduct disorder is that ODD doesn't involve hurting other people deliberately. Um, just like antisocial personality disorder, conduct disorder involves a disregard for the rights of other people and behavior that violates those rights. ODD is basically just a diagnosis for kids who are irritable, defiant, difficult to parent, hard to manage, 
potentially sometimes spiteful or vindictive, but a lot of the symptoms of ODD are, again, really like non-directed. So they're not aggression directed to other people and they're not really directed inward either. It's just this like irritability and anger and difficulty following the rules. Um, conduct disorder is a lot more serious. So this is a disorder that's diagnosed in children and teenagers. Often it's, it's diagnosed based on behavior that starts before age 13. So there's actually 15 symptoms of conduct disorder, but they fall into major categories of um, violating the rights of others. So aggression towards people or animals, just dis destroying other people's property, um, being deceitful or manipulative or conning, or serious rule-breaking behaviors. And the serious rule-breaking behaviors are staying out all night before age 13, and being consistently truant from school before age 13. And the before age 13 part is important there because some of these behaviors, not most of them, but those two behaviors are actually pretty normal for teenagers. They're not normal for children. So for that serious rule breaking to be part of the diagnosis, it has to start really early. Um, but the aggressive behaviors include torturing animals, mugging people, assaulting people, um, rape or coercive sex. The property destruction can involve starting fires. It's so important, I said that twice, I guess. Um, breaking into houses, burglary. The, just, the deceitful behaviors can involve lying, conning people. Um, and then again, the rule-breaking behaviors are truancy and staying out on before age 13. So conduct disorder is a lot more serious and a lot more similar to antisocial personality disorder compared to oppositional defiant disorder. And just to restate, ODD doesn't involve any aggression towards other people or towards animals. The rule breaking involved is usually less severe. So this is like, you know, when the teacher tells you to like put down your phone and line up by the door, these kids don't do that. Um, and when the teacher tells them again, they might throw the phone. Down. But it doesn't involve like serious physical aggression. It doesn't involve trying to hurt anyone. Throwing the phone at the teacher would be an impulsive, like, irritable act, but not an intentionally aggressive one. Um, ODD compared to conduct disorder really more involves problems of emotion regulation, so difficulty managing irritability, frustration, and anger. And ODD, unlike conduct disorder, and especially unlike antisocial personality disorder, is actually equally common in girls and boys. So it's not as gendered as uh, conduct disorder, and especially antisocial personality disorder can be. Unlike oppositional defiant disorder, conduct disorder has a diagnostic specifier, which is not part of the diagnostic criteria. It's not used to diagnose someone with conduct disorder or rule out conduct disorder, but it's used in someone who has conduct disorder to give more information about their clinical presentation and about their prognosis. So that specifier is callous unemotional traits. So callous unemotional traits involve three, three things. So kind of like how narcissism involves these three ingredients, callous unemotional traits involve being callous, so hurting other people and not caring about it, not having empathy for others. Um, being uncaring, so being indifferent to punishment, not having socially normal um, ambition. So these would be kids who like genuinely don't care about family classes in school or adults who don't care that they can't hold a job, like really don't care, not that they want to and try, but their personality disorder gets in the way. They just don't. And then unemotional, so having shallow affect or just not really expressing emotions at all. These are people who don't really have any strong feelings. They might not feel love very strongly. They definitely feel, don't feel guilt or empathy very strongly. So the callous unemotional specifier means that someone's conduct disorder or their antisocial personality disorder is more severe and they have a worse prognosis. It means that they're more likely to engage in instrumental premeditated aggression. So aggression to get something that they want, like rape or burglary, or sorry, mugging, robbery, um, or premeditated. So rather than just like lashing out in anger or giving into an impulse, this is aggression that was planned and purposeful. People without these traits are more likely to engage in reactive aggression, which is aggression in response to being provoked. Callous and emotional traits are not very responsive to the treatments that we have available for um, conduct disorder and antisocial personality disorder. Those treatments really emphasize more 
teaching someone to recognize other people's emotions, teaching someone to respect other people's emotions more. Someone with callous and emotional traits is not motivated to learn that, but also they're um, more likely to be manipulative and indifferent. So they're more likely to lie and pretend that they're responding to treatment, but really not change their behavior at all. And people who are diagnosed with, with callous and emotional traits are more likely to go on to commit crimes. Um, antisocial personality disorder is the diagnosis in the DSM that is for sure the most linked to criminal behavior. Okay, so you might be wondering, oh, and going back, um, I forgot why I had these pictures, but having callous on emotional traits is basically the difference between being like the dad from Shameless, who is basically like a scoundrel with a heart of gold kind of figure. I mean, he does a lot of bad things. He commits a lot of crimes. He's not a good father. He engages in a lot of impulsive, reckless, bad behavior and breaks the law a lot, but he's not a psychopath. He's not a monster. He's not a serial killer. So someone like Hannibal Lecter is someone who has antisocial personality disorder with callous and emotional traits. He is willing to hurt people. It's fun or interesting for him. He doesn't feel bad about it. Whereas the dad from Shameless hurts people but then has remorse and feels guilty for it. Okay, so how does antisociality relate to psychopathy? Really the main thing is, well, there's two main things. One main thing is that all psychopaths have this callousness and lack of empathy, but not everyone with antisocial personality disorder is like that. So for example, you only need to have four of these symptoms to meet criteria for antisocial personality disorder. So someone who um, consistently breaks the law in nonviolent ways, who um, is impulsive and fails to plan ahead, who gets into a lot of physical fights when they feel provoked, and who is really reckless with regard to their own safety. So like they use substances really irresponsibly, they might drive really fast. I mean, yes, that is disregarding other people's safety too, but it's it has a different flavor than instrumentally, intentionally going out of the way to hurt other people. Someone like that could meet criteria for antisocial personality disorder, or someone who seeks stimulation by hurting other people or lying to other people, um, chronic lying, conning and manipulation, so deceitfulness, conning others for pleasure or profit, who has absolutely no remorse for hurting other people, um, lack of remorse or guilt. Someone like that also has antisocial personality disorder, not like completely unoverlapping symptoms. One looks like the dad from Shameless, so someone who makes a lot of terrible life choices and is really aggressive and impulsive. And the other one might look like a serial killer, a psychopath, or, um, as we'll talk about later, the CEO of, of Fortune 500 company. So just like there are two presentations of narcissism, grandiose and vulnerable narcissism, there are also two presentations of conduct disorder and antisocial personality disorder. Antisocial personality disorder without callous unemotional traits is someone who is impulsive, who engages in reactive aggression, where they get aggressive when they're provoked or when they're upset but they don't go out of their way to be aggressive and they don't usually start aggressive interactions. These are people with really poor emotion regulation. And this is the side of antisocial personality disorder that basically just looks like male borderline personality disorder. Obviously women can be diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder. Men can be diagnosed with borderline personality disorder, but this is the type of personality disorder, or sorry, the type of antisocial personality disorder where someone who's really socialized and conditioned to believe that men have to be tough and men have to be strong and men have to physically defend themselves and men don't cry. Someone could have the same, like really similar emotional experiences to borderline personality disorder, have this really dysregulated polyvagal system. Um, but because they're socialized to be a man, respond to those feelings with aggression towards other people and reckless impulsive behavior. And not because they're socialized not to do this, not expressing their emotions as sadness, not engaging in as much relational aggression because that's again, something that women are socialized to do. So the takeaway here is basically that without callous and emotional traits, antisocial personality disorder is really not that different from borderline personality disorder. It just involves more aggression towards other people. Callous and emotional traits in antisocial personality disorder though, looks like a different disorder and it has a different physiology. So whereas people with without callous and emotional traits have poor emotional regulation. 
people with callous and emotional traits kind of have no emotions. Like their emotions are not experienced as strongly as other people's. Partly because of that, they might engage in a lot of proactive aggression because aggression is one way that they can experience feelings and experience emotion. They have to do really extreme things in order to feel the same level of feelings that most of us might feel in our normal day-to-day -day lives. So they're thrill-seeking, they're impulsive, they're reckless, and they might engage in a lot of aggression to try to increase their emotional experiences. So this is a psychopathic presentation of callous and emotional, of, sorry, a psychopathic presentation of antisocial personality disorder. Okay, so successful psychopathy. The textbook talks about this a little bit, but basically there are lots of environments where it's very beneficial to not have empathy and not really feel a lot of anxiety. Um, if you are someone who's living in a really violent, war-torn, dangerous environment, being like this can actually help you survive. It can make you more tough and more capable of defending yourself and your family. If you're in a competitive corporate or business environment, being only out for yourself, not feeling bad about stabbing other people in the back, not feeling bad about taking advantage of people, not feeling bad about doing things that might hurt other people can be really beneficial. So I'm not saying that Mark Zuckerberg is a psychopath, but he definitely has engaged in behavior that suggests a lack of empathy. So one example of this is um, when he was 19, he talked about how people were dumb for trusting him with their data. So people like this can be really successful because of their lack of empathy. But just like hypomanic temperament, even though it's associated with, um, basically it's a, so it, it only has good outcomes when it's in combination with other beneficial traits. So being callous and unemotional is only beneficial if you're in an environment where you have the opportunity to use those traits to succeed. If you, like have a high IQ, if you have good impulse control and emotion regulation. So if you don't have the impulsive dysregulated piece of antisocial personality disorder and you just have this callous unemotional piece, that makes you more likely to be successful. Okay, so I'm not really gonna talk a lot about the physiology of emotion regulation in non-callous unemotional antisocial personality disorder. That's mostly because it's very similar to the physiology of borderline personality disorder. It involves polyvagal inadequacy, so a lack of appropriate regulation of the sympathetic nervous system by the parasympathetic nervous system. It involves distress intolerance, so not being having a really difficult time tolerating negative emotions. So that aspect of emotion regulation where it's just really hard to sit through and feel those emotions without acting on them. And because of that, it involves mostly reactive aggression. Um, and it can be directed at other people or at the self. So very similar to borderline. Callous and emotional antisocial personality disorder, unlike any other disorder that we're gonna talk about in this class, is really characterized by a lack of emotion, not having appropriate emotional responses to things. So the theory is that people with this presentation of antisocial personality disorder have chronically low emotional arousal. They, their sympathetic nervous system does not get excited about anything they're always kind of flat and stable. So that constant low level of arousal is actually experienced as really uncomfortable and people wanna do something to elevate their arousal. They want to feel something. So they engage in a lot of thrill seeking behavior, a lot of reward seeking behavior. They're very insensitive to punishment because they don't get aroused and activated by negative outcomes. And they lack empathy because typically emotional arousal in response to other people's expressions of emotion um, helps us learn to correct our behavior. So for in this example, a little, it's not that uncommon for little kids to be mean to their siblings. So a little kid making their baby sibling cry, that's a pretty normal child behavior. But what happens for a normal child is when their little sibling starts to cry and gets really upset and emotional, they experience empathic arousal. So their body experiences emotional activation too in response to seeing that emotional activation in another person. And that emotional activation is uncomfortable for them. It acts as kind of a punishment for the behavior that they did that made that other person cry. And it makes them less likely to want to do that again because of how bad it feels. And that is really where empathy comes from, um, corrective experiences for new behavior. So psychopaths and people with callous and emotional traits don't have that corrective learning. They don't have an empathic negative emotional response to other people's negative emotions. 
So it's easier for them to hurt other people without feeling any negative repercussions. So one demonstration of this, um, a lot of this research was done by Adrian Rain, uh, who's a really famous criminology researcher and expert in antisocial personality disorder. He has this amazing longitudinal study where he has actually been collecting data from the same population, um, a group of people living in the African island of Mauritius for like decades. So he started collecting data from some of them when they were like three years old and he continued to collect data from them into their forties. So this is data that was collected when this cohort was 15 years old. And this is basically resting state autonomic arousal. So measures of sympathetic activity taken when they're not doing anything. They're not experiencing strong emotions. They're not intentionally trying to relax. They're just existing. So they took two kinds of recordings. This is heart rate, so beat per minute. And this is skin conductance. So again, heart rate is a measure of sympathetic nervous activity. Your heart beats faster when your sympathetic nervous system is activated. Skin conductance is also a measure of sympathetic arousal. Your hands sweat more, so there's more electrodermal activity when you're aroused. So in the black bars are 15-year-old kids who hadn't done anything yet, but who would go on to commit crimes when they were by the time they were 24. At 15, before they committed any crimes, they had lower resting state autonomic arousal than children who wouldn't go on to commit crimes before 24 years of age. This was shown in both their heart rates. So their heart rate was on average like five beats per minute slower, which is a pretty substantial difference. And their skin conductance level was also substantially lower. So the takeaway from this is that 15-year-old kids who would later go on to commit crimes, they hadn't done anything yet. They had lower resting state arousal than their peers who didn't commit crimes. And before you get like nervous about this as some kind of like, man, I wish I remember the name of that movie. Uh, you know, the movie where they like predict who's going to commit crimes and punish them before they do. These data are not clear cut enough to actually be able to pinpoint like you in particular are going to commit a crime because your heart rate is low. Uh, these are just averages. So of course there were kids who went on to commit crimes who had higher heart rates than kids who did not. This is not anything that you could use at an individual level to predict who will commit crime. It's just an average description of people who commit crimes more likely to be antisocial, more likely to have low resting state arousal. So, in addition to just having generally low arousal when there's no stimulus happening, people with callous and emotional antisocial traits are also fearless. They don't experience sympathetic arousal in response to things that would make other people feel afraid. And one way of showing this is um, conditioning studies, fear conditioning studies. So one study design that's often used is children or adults will be in an experimental context where every time they see a blue light, they experience a mild but painful shock. So the blue light is always paired with a shock and the blue light becomes a an, um, conditioned stimulus. So whenever they see that blue light, someone who develops fear conditioning would have an autonomic sympathetic response to seeing that blue light, even in the absence of the shock. The sympathetic anxiety response is the conditioned response to the blue light, which is the conditioned stimulus. That's just an example of fear learning. So if people with callous and emotional traits don't experience sympathetic arousal in response to fear, they won't experience sympathetic arousal in response to conditioned fear stimuli. They won't be able to learn that association. Being fearless and not being able to learn from punishment enables more risky, more dangerous behavior. And it makes people punishment insensitive. So here's an example of that. Um, fearlessness, in addition to being able to predict things like who will go on to commit crimes, which is all antisocial personality, not just callous and emotional, fearlessness actually helps to differentiate um, people who will go on to be aggressive, proactively aggressive against other people from people who just have a lot of impulsive emotion dysregulation problems. So these are the, sort of the two clusters of antisocial personality disorder. And what this is showing is that um, children who at age three were not good at learning this response, who were not good at learning, um, sorry, who were not good at learning like, 
to experience a fear response and when they were exposed to a stimulus that had previously been exposed with a painful shock. Kids who didn't develop a condition response to that stimulus had higher scores on measures of aggression. Even children who at eight had not actually engaged in any aggressive behavior. So being able to experience fear conditioning was actually a better predictor of who would go on to be aggressive, who would consistently engage in aggressive behavior than even previous aggressive behavior. So these are kids who had been aggressive in the past, sometime between ages three and eight. These were kids who had never been aggressive between ages three and eight. That didn't really predict which ones would go on to engage in proactive, intentional aggression. What was better at predicting that was whether they were good conditioners or poor conditioners. So what the bar graphs are showing is there's scores on a measure of aggression. So again, some of these kids had engaged in aggression and some hadn't, but at age eight, the ones who were bad at, at developing fear conditioning were more aggressive. They were more likely to have aggressive feelings to want to hurt other people. But they, there was no difference between good conditioners and poor conditioners and other symptoms of antisocial personality, like being aggressive and sensation seeking. So in addition to predicting aggressive intentions in eight-year-olds, it also predicts criminal behavior in 23-year-olds. So the same three-year-old children who were bad at developing fear conditioning were more likely to have committed crimes by the time they were in their early 20s. So a conditioning deficit at age three is predicting aggressive behavior at age eight, even better than aggressive behavior at age three. And it's also predicting criminal offending at age 23. So the last piece of evidence I'm going to show for this is that people with antisocial traits, in addition to being bad at regulating their own emotions, and in addition to not having appropriate fear responses, they also are bad at recognizing other people's emotions. So this is a study, this happens to be a study of women, but this has been replicated a lot. But in this group of women with conduct disorder, um, those with the disorder were worse at recognizing facial expressions of anger and disgust compared to healthy controls. And these two emotions are particularly important because these are threatening emotions. When someone you're interacting with looks at you like this or like this, that should be a sign that you're in danger and your sympathetic nervous system should become more active and you should be like getting ready to fight or run away. People with antisocial personality disorder are not noticing these facial cues. So they're not experiencing sympathetic arousal in response to them. The reason that they're impaired at recognition in part is because a lot of recognition of facial um, information is unconscious. So in the prosopagnosia part of the psychosis lecture, we talked about how there are different streams of visual processing. Some of them are conscious and some of them are unconscious. One of the unconscious streams of visual processing goes right to the amygdala, which is the part of our brain that helps us feel fear and emotions. So when we see an angry face, that visual information goes to the amygdala before it ever goes to the visual cortex and before we become consciously aware that we're seeing an angry face. So people who have that amygdala fear response to seeing the angry face will be better at recognizing facial expressions of anger than people who don't have that emotional immediate response. Having the emotional response is important for recognition. So that again is all people with antisocial traits. What was particular to people with callous and emotional traits is that they were actually extra bad at recognizing sadness. So this seems to indicate that Whereas people with like overall antisocial personality disorder are not good at recognizing threat relevant information. They're not good at feeling fear and anxiety. People with callous and emotional traits on top of that are also impaired at recognizing signs of sadness in other people. So this is why people can, people with these traits can hurt others and not really feel any empathy because they're not really recognizing and having an emotional response to those signs of sadness that they're causing. So to put it all together, Antisocial traits, and particularly callous and emotional traits, involve um, problems with the amygdala. The amygdala is the part of the brain that helps us feel fear. And um, these are fMRI images of healthy, normal controls, seeing negative facial expressions. So this is showing a lot of amygdala activation in response to those negative facial expressions. Going through a fear conditioning paradigm, so learning to be afraid of a formerly meaningless stimulus like a blue light and experiencing emotional arousal. 
So all of these functions that are impaired in people with antisocial traits, especially callous and emotional traits, involve the amygdala. And also the areas of the brain that the amygdala communicates with, like the anterior, anterior cingulate and the orbital frontal cortex. That circuit is really involved in fear learning, especially. So people with antisocial traits are impaired at feeling fear, they're impaired at recognizing fear in others, and they're impaired at learning from fear. So what this means is that people with antisocial traits, and especially those who lack empathy, can't learn from observing other people's responses to their behavior. If they make other people angry or if they make them sad, they aren't recognizing feeling and emotion, so they're not able to learn from it. They also don't learn, don't learn from punishment or aversive conditioning. So they're not able to form conditioned associations to things like shocks. They're also not able to form conditioned associations to screaming at or hitting my baby brother and getting put in the timeout chair. That punishment just doesn't help them learn. They have chronic low arousal, which is uncomfortable and makes them want to engage in thrill-seeking, exciting activities. So putting it all together, basically this means that people who are antisocial and particularly people who are callous and unemotional are insensitive to punishment, but they are sensitive to reward. So the best way to help someone with these traits change their behaviors is to help them realize that they're not getting what they want. So help them see ways in which their aggression or their um, poor impulse control or their deliberate hurting or conning other people is actually getting in the way of them getting what they want. That's really the only thing that's gonna get through to someone with callous and emotional traits. And then for everyone with um, antisocial behavior, because they're not good at learning from punishment, it's better to change their behavior with reward. So rather than punishing them for being bad, reward them for being good. Okay, so to summarize, there's these four cluster B personality disorders, narcissistic, antisocial, histrionic, and borderline. All of them involve emotion regulation deficits in some way, both interpersonal emotion regulation, so relying on other people to regulate self-esteem, and intrapersonal, so being able to manage feelings of anger without lashing out at yourself or other people. They all involve some level of aggression towards other people, whether that's relational aggression, which you see more in narcissistic personality disorder and borderline personality disorder, or physical aggression, like you see in antisocial personality disorder. They all involve impulsivity and thrill seeking, um, which in borderline personality disorder is seen as a way of regulating extreme unbalanced emotions and feelings of emptiness, whereas in antisocial personality disorder, it's seen as a way of regulating chronic low arousal. They all, to some extent, have impaired empathy, and they all have unstable sense of self or unstable self-esteem. So overall takeaways from the splitting approach, the splitting approach says that personality disorders have more in common with related symptom disorders and or the other personality disorders in their cluster than they have with each other. So according to this approach, cluster A personality disorders are really just manifestations of attenuated psychotic symptoms. Cluster B personality disorders are manifestations of impaired emotion regulation and impulsivity. And cluster C disorders are really extreme presentations of anxiety disorders. So this is the last segment. We're gonna just talk about the lumping approach and one model that explains how personality disorders relate to other personality disorders um, through impaired attachment and early child experiences. Okay, so we are almost done, um, which is very exciting. So we're just gonna talk a little bit, like I just said, I think, but I paused the recording for a second to get some water. So I'm gonna say it again. We're gonna be talking about the lumping approach to personality disorders, explaining how they relate to each other instead of how they relate to other symptom disorders. And the way that this is explained is that all of them involve disruptive attachment and problematic early childhood experiences. Okay, so this is based on attachment theory, which is a theory, not really theory because it's definitely true. It's a theory in the sense that it's actually a very accepted piece of scientific knowledge that's supported by lots of hypothesis testing. Um, and that is that children need a close, stable, and nurturing relationship with at least one primary caregiver in order to have normal social and emotional development. And in this instance, what normal social and emotional development means is the ability to regulate emotions, the ability to form and maintain interpersonal relationships, and the ability to have high and stable self-esteem. So, Basically everything that 
is re that um, requires stable attachment is what's disturbed in people with personality disorders, emotion regulation, interpersonal functioning, and self-esteem. So attachment experiences, which is the relationship that you have with that primary caregiver, who's your main source of um, nurturance and comfort in childhood. And for kids with two parents, you have attachments to both parents. For kids with a single parent, you have attachments to one. For kids with one good parent and one bad parent, having stable attachment with one parent can um, help you have good outcomes. But basically attachment refers to how comfortable a person is with separation, um, so being on their own, and closeness, so being in intimate relationships, and also how negatively or positively they feel about themselves and other people. So you can think about it as having um, two axes with each axis representing two things. So the up and down axis represents wanting a lot of closeness at the high end and not wanting closeness, being really uncomfortable with closeness at the low end. Also at the high end of this up and down access is having really positive views of other people. So understandably, if you tend to have, high, have positive views of other people, you are more likely to be comfortable with close relationships on average. And if you tend to have negative views of other people, you're less likely to be comfortable with relationships. On the horizontal axis, on one end is desire for separation. So how comfortable you are being alone. Also on this end of the axis is <clears throat> positive views of yourself. So again, if you're comfortable with yourself and like yourself and are happy in your own company, you're more likely to be comfortable with separation and being alone. On the other end of the axis is anxiety about separation, fear of separation, and also negative self-opinion, negative views of yourself. So it's important to note right here that even though attachment is thought to originate with early childhood experiences, it's not fixed and it can be changed. Therapy changes attachment styles all the time. Attachment styles also, um, a person can be said to have an attachment style, which is how they approach relationships in general, but you can have different types of attachment with different people in your life. So there is no one-to-one -one relationship between any kind of attachment style. So level of desire for closeness, positive or negative views of self and others, and any personality disorder. Um, but just to kind of summarize this figure, the attachment style that's characterized by high desire for closeness and generally high, positive views of other people or negative views of yourself is what's known as anxious or attack, anxious or preoccupied attachment. This is where you're like, very desperate for connection, very anxious about being abandoned, um, really feel like you need other people to nurture you, feel like you can't do that for yourself. On the opposite end of the spectrum would be someone who has a really high desire for separation, fairly positive views of themselves, but fairly negative views of other people and low desire for closeness. This would be someone who prefers isolation, who is kind of ambivalent about relationships, not really always interested in having them, who tends to be kind of emotionally distant and who basically is comfortable on their own. Someone who has a relatively low desire for closeness, but also fear of separation, has what's known as fearful or avoidant attachment, also known as ambivalent attachment, where they experience a lot of internal conflict about whether they should be in a relationship. Their relationships tend to be really dramatic, really up and down, um, really great sometimes, really bad other times. Um, a lot of ambivalence about whether they want to be close to other people. Um, and then secure attachment, which is the most common attachment style, about 50% of people have secure attachment in most of their relationships, is basically just like being pretty comfortable on your own, being pretty comfortable with intimacy, feeling pretty positively about yourself and feeling pretty positively about other people. So like I said, there's no one-to-one -one relationship between attachment style or self other representations and personality disorders. You can't put the personality disorders on this axis, on this chart. So for example, a personality disorder that's simply characterized by very negative views of other people, but not specifically characterized on any of the other dimensions would be a paranoid personality disorder. A personality disorder characterized by very negative self views, alternating positive and negative other views, 
and very high desire for closeness would be borderline personality disorder. So there's that splitting, the unstable relationships, really negative views of themselves, but still like this desperate fear of abandonment and being alone. Someone whose desire for closeness is inhibited by really negative self views would be someone with avoidant personality disorder, for example. Someone with very positive views of themselves and relatively negative views of other people would be someone with narcissistic or histrionic personality disorder. Someone who's just indifferent to other people doesn't feel positively or negatively about them is schizoid personality disorder. Someone who desires closeness but has difficulty achieving or understanding it could be someone with schizotypal personality disorder, could be someone with avoidant personality disorder. Someone with very negative views of themselves, very positive views of other people, and very high desire for closeness would be someone with dependent personality disorder. So as you can see, these personality disorders, they can be characterized by disrupted attachment. So extreme um, desire for closeness or extreme desire for separation, or they can be characterized by disrupted self other views. So very positive self views or very negative self views, very positive other views or very negative other views, but they don't have to be characterized by all four things. So attachment is just like a way of thinking of personality disorders, but it doesn't really classify them that well. So the missing piece and how we actually classify personality disorders and what actually connects attachment styles and self other representations to behavior and emotions is schemas. So we've talked about schemas in this class before. The one that we talk about a lot is schemas about the world. So the idea that the world is safe versus the world is dangerous. That's a really high level schema, but in cognitive psychology, what we actually mean when we talk about schemas is these like little nuggets of mental representation. So these representations are associated with prototypes. Um, so like examples, things that resemble that schema and responses. So natural tendencies that we have that are activated by the schema to um, that sort of teach us how to engage with the schema. So what this figure is showing is how schemas are activated, schemas about objects. So it starts with sensory perception, and then it starts with that sensory perception crossing the sensory threshold, so sensory gating. If the, if the stimuli or the perception aren't strong enough, our schemas are never activated because it never comes to conscious attention. But if something crosses the sensory threshold, we pay attention to it, it's activated at a neural level, there's recognition in the brain, it activates a long-term memory node, and that long-term memory node is connected to episodic information. So experiences you've had, in this case with dogs, semantic memory, so things that you know about dogs, facts that you know about them, like that they're mammals, they're related to wolves, they eat meat, things like that. The schema for dog is activated, which in this case means that there's an actual mental representation of dogs. So there's like this area of your brain, that's the dog area of your brain, where all of your facts and feelings and knowledge about dogs is contained. That's activated when you see a dog. And that activation spreads to the motivational behavioral parts of your brain. So if your schema for dogs is positive, it might make you feel happy, excited, you might approach, you might want to play with the dog. If you have a dog phobia and you have a negative schema for dogs, you might, it might activate your fight or flight response. But basically schemas in this, in, in this context refer to core beliefs. So deep underlying explanatory beliefs about the self, other people and relationships. And where schemas come from, where schemas about relationships and the self come from is that when childhood needs aren't met adequately, children develop unhealthy beliefs about the world because the people who set our expectations for relationships and how other people should treat us and how we deserve to be treated are usually our parents. Our parents are our first important relationship and it's how we form our views of relationships. So when a child's needs are not met appropriately, their relationship schemas and their schemas about themselves and other people are maladaptive and problematic. So one way that this can happen is through child abuse and borderline personality disorder and antisocial personality disorder are strongly associated with child abuse. Um, it's not to say that everyone with borderline was abused as a child and the abuse that they experience kind of varies, but studies have shown that clinically referred samples of kids with borderline personality disorder have very high rates of child abuse upwards of 80%. And the same is true of antisocial personality disorder. So it might be tempting to say that, well, child abuse obviously makes people like this. It causes antisocial or borderline personality disorder. But 
Impulsivity and emotion regulation, which are key traits of both borderline and antisocial personality disorder, are strongly heritable. Our, so our like polyvagal adequacy is um, very heritable. It's informed by our genes and biology. And we get that from our parents. So the same people who are creating an abusive environment are also people who gave us their genes to be emotionally dysregulated and impulsive. So emotionally dysregulated impulsive parents are more likely to abuse their children. They're also giving their children those impulsive dysregulated genes. Similarly, and this is not at all to victim blame, but there is research showing that kids who are impulsive and emotionally dysregulated are more likely to experience abuse. They're more likely to experience harsh parenting. They are more likely to be punished a lot if they have parents who are prone to child abuse. They're more likely to elicit it than a child in the same family who's more inhibited, more shy, better at regulating their emotions. So even though these disorders are very highly correlated with abusive and harsh parenting, the causality is pretty unclear because the majority of people are raised by their biological parents. So the parents who create the childhood environment also gave that child their genes. So it's very hard to say which came first. Also, personality disorders are not always or even usually associated with child abuse, thinking about the full spectrum of personality disorders. But personality disorders are, are all associated with disruptive attachment. So how does that happen? Um, more normal, parenting that's in the more normal range can also cause maladaptive schemas to develop, especially in a child who's already vulnerable for um, genetic reasons. So a child who already has some of these personality traits, like for example, a child who has traits that make them less open, more rigid, less agreeable, very neurotic, um, and very conscientious. So a child who has a lot of the temperamental features of OCPD, if those parents are really authoritarian, if they punish the kid anytime they do something less than perfect, if they, expose the kid to really harsh judgments of other people if they raise the kid in a really punitive religious atmosphere, that parenting is interacting with that child's traits that they were born with to make them even more likely to develop these schemas that then make them more likely to go on to have this personality disorder. So other types of parenting can be like mildly neglectful parenting or parenting that meets a child's physical needs but not their emotional needs for interaction. It can be immature parenting where parents like play pranks on their kids or treat their kids like friends instead of, ch of children. It can be stage parenting or parents who push their kids to do things that the parents value but the kids don't necessarily value. Also personality disorders are really linked to parental absence and separation. So this is stuff like totally outside of parents control, like a parent dying, a parent being sick, a parent being incarcerated. But the bottom line is that across the board, personality disorder traits are heritable between 50 and 80%, which is more heritable than major depression. And in the case of um, schizotypal personality disorder, as heritable as schizophrenia, because it's the same genetic liability that makes it heritable. But the takeaway is that personality disorder traits are heritable. And so personality disorders are never caused by parenting. It's an interaction of the environment, which is parenting, and the genes for temperament, for risk for psychosis, for risk for anxiety, and risk for emotion dysregulation and impulsivity. So the book gives some examples of personality disorder schemas, but I just wanted to run through them here too. So again, schemas are just like deep-seated, inherent, unexamined often beliefs about the world and other people. And these schemas help explain someone's experiences. They help um, organize their behavior. So someone with paranoid personality disorder has a deep-seated belief that other people can't be trusted. Someone with schizotypal personality disorder might believe that they're just too different and other people won't get them. Also, other people are just sort of confusing and unpredictable, and therefore it's better to stay away from them. Someone with schizoid personality disorder might believe that relationships are undesirable. They won't be pleasant. Someone with histrionic personality disorder might believe that people are an audience. Other people are there to serve me or admire me. Someone with narcissism might believe that I'm special and I deserve special rules and special treatment and deference from other people. 
An antisocial person might think rules don't apply to me, other people's feelings don't matter, or I don't even realize that other people's feelings exist. Borderline personality disorder would be like, I need other people. I won't be, I won't feel full, like feel whole without them, but I'm unlovable. And so I won't ever have what I want. Someone with avoidant personality disorder might think I'm defective, I suck, and if people knew the real me, they would reject me. So I'm just not gonna let them ever know the real me so that they can't reject me. Someone with dependent personality disorder would think I can't take care of myself, I need other people to survive and to be happy. And someone with OCPD might think people need to always try their best, they should always be trying harder, and I always have to strive to be the best. So thinking back to that child who already has a temperament that makes them feel like they need to try really hard, so they're conscientious. It's hard for them to get along with other people. They're sort of disagreeable. They're, very, they're anxious and sensitive to punishment. They're neurotic. Um, and they're rigid and inflexible, so they're low in openness. They already have this temperament. And then they have parents who explicitly teach them this, that if you don't always try your best according to our very high standards that we punish, it would be easy for them to come to this conclusion. I always have to try really hard. People who don't try really hard are bad and deserve to be punished. Okay, we're close to the end. This is just one slide. So treating personality disorders. Personality disorders are so stigmatized um, because they're thought of as really hard to treat, really resistant to treatment, but that's actually not true. Um, there are several therapeutic options that really help people with personality disorders improve. The personality disorders that are most resistant to treatment would probably be um, antisocial personality disorder with callous unemotional features and maybe narcissistic and histrionic personality disorder. Narcissistic because it's very hard to get them to A, admit that anything is wrong with them and B, believe that you as the therapist can help them because they think that they're better than you. Um, and I've definitely experienced this with clients before who are coming for problems other than narcissism but didn't believe that any therapist was like smart enough or talented enough to help them because they were special. And then with histrionic personality disorder, people don't often seek treatment for that. It's very rare that it's diagnosed. I've never seen it or diagnosed it myself. Um, but people who have really shallow emotions, it can, that's a problem that we just don't, as psychologists, have the toolkit to treat right now. But Dialectical behavior therapy is the treatment of choice for borderline personality disorder. And it really focuses on first, just regulating behavior. So prevent suicide, prevent self-injury, stop acting out recklessly. And then while they're doing that, learn how to regulate these really strong emotions and tolerate distress without acting on it. Schema-focused cognitive therapy <clears throat> focuses on recognizing schemas. <clears throat> Sorry recognizing schemas and actually changing them through corrective experiences. So for that person who has a schema that people who don't try their hardest deserve to be punished, one way to try to change that schema would be try to recognize people that, that in their life that they have a lot of compassion for and try to apply some of that compassion to themselves. Other ways could be have corrective experiences. So experiment with violating your own rules with not always trying and see what happens. Like, do you get punished? Do you still think that you deserve to be punished? Psychodynamic psychotherapy, um, it's not something that I have any expertise in. So we have a guest lecturer this week who's gonna tell us all about um, psychodynamic psychotherapy for personality. But essentially like schema-focused therapy, it's really focused on ideas about self, others, and attachment. One way that's different from schema-focused therapy is that it, really takes advantage of the therapeutic relationship. So the way that the therapist and patient relate to each other to try to recognize, help the patient recognize and identify their self other representations and work on their attachment style in the relationship with the therapist. Um, an example of this with the OCPD patient might be like if the therapist is five minutes late to the session and apologizes, that patient might have a really hard time forgiving them because they think that anyone who is ever late or whoever makes a mistake is a bad person. But if they have a pre-existing relationship where they like and trust the therapist, the therapist can actually use that mistake that they made to illustrate that sometimes good people make mistakes too. And sometimes forgiving mistakes is a better option than continuing to ruminate on them. An emerging treatment option and really one of the most promising is prevention. 
So personality disorders can't be diagnosed until adulthood and personality is not really stable until young adulthood. So addressing some of these problems in children, including emotion regulation, but also just anxiety and prodromal psychosis can prevent the development of symptom disorders in the anxiety spectrum and schizophrenia, as well as cluster B personality disorders. And then lastly, interventions that focus on parenting are really especially important for antisocial personality disorders. So teaching parents that their kid with antisocial traits is not going to respond to punishment, but will respond to reward. That can be a way that parents early on can help a child who doesn't really have natural empathy still learn to regulate their behavior and behave in a socially acceptable way. So we're gonna be hearing from Jack Keith, who's um, a friend of mine from grad school and currently a fellow at Cornell Hospital on the psychodynamic treatment of personality disorders. And that, that guest lecture will be posted separately. Okay, so here's some extra credit opportunities. Um, and that is the end for today.